I always wondered if it was easy to grow a chocolate plant, so I made it happen. So I got the fruit that chocolate comes from. And yes, I can in fact confirm that chocolate is the salad. I've also always wanted to make my own chocolate, so we took 10 seeds to grow into a plant and the rest for our chocolate salad to make chocolate. And my besties, you're all probably wondering if I called him yet. I didn't. And so it began. Well, this is a cacao pod. Inside are the seeds that we ferment, roast, and grind to make chocolate. The seeds, they're covered in a white sticky pulp that's high in sugar, but you can consume it. It's really good. Some people make jams, liquors, drinks, other desserts, but it's got a tangy flavor and to me it tastes like a lychee mixed with a mangosteen. It's one of the most unique and best fruits I've ever tried and I would eat 10 of them if I could. But the cacao seeds are what finally get turned into chocolate. The seeds, they're like a dark chocolate mosaic, and in order to grow it, we're gonna have to remove that outer gelatinous layer of skin from the seeds to reveal the inner cacao nibs. And botanists say that the 30 to 50 seeds that lie in the pod can even germinate in 24 hours. So we got to work. We peeled each seed so we could prep them to sprout the little baby tails. Then we placed our seeds in orderly fashion on a damp piece of paper towel. We sealed that in a glass jar. And we started the daily timer, spritzing it with water religiously to keep it damp and give it the right environmental conditions to grow. And we also planted some in soil so that we could optimize our chances of growth in case the germination failed but I waited seven days and after the first 24 hours passed something insane happened because the little tails they started to sprout out a couple days passed they started to grow tails day three and four came around and I was still so excited for our chocolate plant I thought hmm what could go wrong everything's going so right and of course I kept religiously spritzing it every other day with more water to keep that paper towel damp and you know what they say you never know until you try but you got to take good care of it but day five and six came around it did look like the seeds were starting to darken I started to wonder if I needed to keep the outer gelatinous white layer of skin on the seeds so that they could germinate because they looked to be getting a bit moldy and I wasn't sure why they were getting dark either. But if we know anything, it's that plants are all trial and error. And sometimes you have to try many times and some mold is okay, but this was some pretty sketch mycelium. Well, I also had my grow box handy and by day seven, I realized if I wanted to save these little lives, I had to put the last seeds standing in my grow box to give them the optimal conditions to grow. And don't worry, you don't have to wait until next week for results because I wouldn't do you dirty like that. We got all the results in this video. So we got the seeds in my grow box. And after we did that, of course, we had to continue religiously checking the seeds in the soil. They were looking really good. I was very happy and I went back to the grow box a couple weeks later, made sure the seed was still alive and thriving. It did look like it shrunk up a little bit, but it's nonetheless doing very well. But pro tip, don't touch them so much because I swear that had something to do with the failure of germination rates in comparison to my other plants. But Cacao pods are also exotic fruits, so you really never know what will and won't grow in the freezing temperatures of the harsh winters of Canada. They seemed like they were doing so well so far in the grow box. But if you're as invested on an emotional level to this as I am, then listen up, because about two weeks passed after I put my seeds in my grow box, and like I said, sketch mycelium. But nonetheless, and they were looking incred. I was very excited and thought we were well on our way to growing a chocolate salad. I actually also put a couple of them in my grow box and some of them had lots of potential, but the tails were actually starting to have some sort of growth traction and some nice roots were shooting out of the sprout, so I put it back in its home and I left it. But the next week I went to check on them and they also started to turn black like the ones that were germinating on the paper towel and the ones in the soil, of course I was still checking, they seemed pretty dead. But I was determined to succeed. So you know what I had to do? I got my hands on another cacao pod, but this one must have been a different variety because it was something out of Rick and Morty. The seeds were purple and the flesh seemed like it was rotting. My fingers and my hands turned orange. I was really not down for this. And I was just happy we had the second cacao pod because I didn't care how we opened it. What really mattered was the seeds. I also got a lot of the rotten flesh juice in my eye. It was a crazy experience. I almost questioned my sanity at one point. It was a true disaster. But when you're at rock bottom, the only way that you can go is up. 
So after crying a little bit I, and making sure I didn't have an eye infection, I got to work and I got all the seeds and I peeled them all nice and, and dandy. My orange hands and everything, but the seeds kind of looked weird, like something was off with them. Open the exact moment that I got this juice in my eye. Oh my god. That's literally the worst idea ever. What the Right it's a very difficult time, okay? But none of that mattered. The only thing that mattered in this moment to me was growing a chocolate plant in Canada, especially when it was the winter. So we took the seeds, spent a few hours separating them all. They still looked kind of sketch, not gonna lie. But I got them on a piece of damp paper towel in orderly fashion, waited a week. Within seven days, I'm telling you, sketch mycelium follows us everywhere. So you know what we needed to do. Another cacao pod number three. This one, it seemed promising. We extracted our seeds, peeled that outer gelatinous layer of skin off and got them in orderly fashion on a damp piece of paper towel and waited seven days. And this is what happened. It was a little bit more promising, but still, sketch mycelium. But there were a few little golden tails. So I put those in my grow box. I was still determined as heckin' to grow a darn chocolate plant. So you know we got cacao pod number four. This time I was on vacation in Florida and I'm like, well, I have the perfect growing conditions in my environment to grow chocolate and it's gonna work. So I took the seeds. You know what we did, got the seeds ready to grow and seven days passed, another seven days and they looked really, really good. So I changed the paper towel. I went and looked at them at another week and it didn't look like it grew Grew, but it looked like it shrunk but at this point I traveled from Florida to LA and I was like okay you know I wasn't satisfied I knew where I went wrong with some of these things so I thought okay we're gonna grow these ones cacao pod number five get them on a piece of damp paper towel I'm determined as heckin cacao pod number five is the last one that we're gonna try to grow this plant and if it doesn't work then we're just gonna heckin and make chocolate by the way the skin is so good it's all edible, it tastes so sweet, it's like a lychee, but I took the seeds, got them prepared to make chocolate, but I also took some of them to grow. I even added cinnamon to prevent that sketch mycelium. And the tails again, they were looking okay. So they also just shrunk up. So after months of trying to sprout these seeds, failing time and time again, I thought it's finally time to make chocolate with these seeds. We still have the ones in our grow box and hopefully they'll grow. But frustrated but not defeated, but I really need some chocolate salad right now. I changed the approach a little bit to make something delicious with the cacao pods, the leftover seeds. But we roasted the cacao beans, we removed the shell, we ground them into a powder, mixed them with sugar, added a splash of milk and blended it. And after a few hours, I had chocolate. But this chocolate, it was like the texture of a brownie and it tasted really good, but it was a thick dark chocolate. And I wanted to make one that was nice and runny chocolate and chocolate that was a little bit more sweet because I don't think I added enough sugar. So I made a second round of chocolate. Really should have gotten a chocolate mold, but this time I was creative. I used baking cups as my mold and I still think it had to be a bit more creamy, maybe needed more milk. I'm not really sure, I'm not a chocolatier. Still worked out really well and this time it I even tasted so much better than the last time. So five cacao pods, two chocolate making sessions, and one surviving chocolate seed that's still in its grow box home. These cacao pods had me in a chokehold and they're not releasing me until I grow a darn chocolate plant successfully. It's definitely safe to say that this was like nothing that I ever tried before. And although we didn't fully succeed in growing a full blown plant with cacao pods growing on it, we did learn that sometimes failure can lead to unexpected and delicious discoveries. And who knows? Maybe we'll try again with cacao pod number six in a little bit, but I did say that I always wondered if chocolate was easy to grow. And I pretty much made it happen and got my chocolate salad too. And I never called him, by the way. So thanks so much for watching and being part of this chocolate growing journey with me. I found a bug on my strawberry and grew it into a butterfly. At least what I thought would be a butterfly. I took the little green caterpillar and put her in my little animal kingdom. Added some oats, some pieces of apple. I was determined to be a very good caterpillar mother and I waited a few weeks for something to happen. But when I checked on it, I saw that there were numerous little bugs and they weren't green caterpillars and I was very confused. I started to watch these little bugs morph into something other than a beautiful butterfly. I was itchy looking at these things and quite confused because I was hoping that maybe that little green caterpillar had babies and we would have a hundred butterflies instead of just one. After all, it does look like a caterpillar, right? 
Right. So, to prepare for the birth of our butterflies, I did a few things. We needed to help the butterflies thrive. I got some milkweed seed pods, the host plant for monarch butterflies to lay their eggs on, in the hopes that I would not only grow a butterfly, but also have that butterfly become my pet and lay eggs on the milkweed leaves. The pods that I got my hands on weren't dried out yet, so I went back and got another dried pod, and I opened it to see that the seeds had turned brown and silky, and they were ready to plant in the soil. So I planted them in a little pot. Now I've never grown milkweed before, so I figured this butterfly has got to be bougie. Now it is notoriously difficult to grow milkweed from seed, so just in case to cut any losses, I went to the plant store and I bought a milkweed plant so that we would for sure have leaves that these butterflies could lay their eggs on. Brought it home and planted it, and it would surely be ready for that butterfly once it sprouted out from that cocoon. Y'all, I even went as far as growing wildflowers from seeds. These flowers in specific help attract butterflies. Of course, I wanted a family of butterflies to come adopt my baby. So it's safe to say that I was ready to go to war, making sure this butterfly sprouted with my milkweed seed pods, my wildflowers, and my milkweed store-bought plant. That actually started to grow really nicely. As you can see, I was being a very good plant parent. It was even growing pink flowers. But as I was waiting for the butterfly to hatch though, I saw that there were little moving things on this plant. I was freaking out. The store-bought milkweed plant had living, moving creatures on it. And this was my first time ever seeing this in my life. So at that point in time, I didn't realize that you could buy ladybugs and put them on the plant. And then the ladybugs would have a five course feast with their families. Because they eat these things what they call aphids. But since I only learned that after trying to get rid of the bugs myself, what I did was I put together a mixture of a teaspoon of oil, a teaspoon of dish soap, a tablespoon of baking soda, and some kelp plant fertilizer, and I diluted that in water, and I became a religious spritzer. Spritzed it on my plants every day, twice a day, until the bugs started to look like they were goners. I basically became a ladybug. Mm -mm -mm. And once the bugs died, we got back to work. But you're probably wondering, well, plant lady, what in the heck happened to the little green caterpillar bug you found on your strawberry? Is it now a butterfly? And why were there so many in the little animal kingdom if there was only one caterpillar? Well, these things began to shed different linings, so I still had hope that they were butterflies, but soon I realized that this skin they were shedding was not caterpillar skin, it was mealworm skin, and they were turning into beetles. Once I found this information out, I immediately took one of the worms and fed my Venus flytrap plant, because these worms are like a nice steak and potatoes for Venus flytrap plants. So I fed him real nice, reminded me of Seymour, but that little bug, oh my goodness, was wiggling its way out. That little f was trying to escape from the left hand corner and I had to get it out of the soil fast because they're pests. They procreate like crazy and they cannot be thrown outside or they'll infiltrate the dealer and find the supplier. Well, basically the entirety of your property and you'll never be able to get rid of them. They kind of remind me of how when you're trying to get rid of ants, but they just always find their way back. Yeah, well, these are pests and I was stumped because I really wanted butterflies. I realized that I knew why this turned into a mealworm and not a butterfly. A few months ago, I was doing some research and I learned that you can grow mealworms into beetles and watch the life cycle transform. And I thought that was extremely cool, yet kind of gross. And I knew they sold mealworms for pets like lizards and geckos in my local pet store. So you know what I did? I ran to the pet store, sprinted in fact, and purchased some mealworms, put them in their new home to morph into the next stages of their lives. And the thing with mealworms is that they continue to procreate and once they have their eggs, they basically never die. And I didn't realize this when I got the mealworms but I really wanted to get rid of those mealworms after watching the life cycle yes it was really cool but I really wanted these things out of my house but at the same time I wanted to keep them it was a weird feeling like when you break up with an ex you know it's wrong but you can't stop going back well if you're anything like me you think this is fascinating too because even though it's not butterflies it's still so cool but the wings will unfold it will appear creamy in color but then it will turn brown as you can see they started to procreate and once they're brown they're sexually mature and they begin to look for a mate and then when they mate they have eggs that are minuscule in size you can't see them with the eye we had a lot of mealworms in this container there were like 50 of them right well anywho i knew that i needed to find a solution to this 
problem, so I called up my friend Angel because she is Lenny the Gecko's mom and I told her, hey, I have some mealworms for you, come pick them up. And she said, oh my god, I was actually wanting to start a mealworm farm with my dad for Lenny, so thank you so much, I'm on my way. She even gave me updates on whether or not Lenny the Gecko liked them or not and I think it's safe to say that there's a reason behind everything and the reason this was not a butterfly but a mealworm really is for Lenny to feast daily on these things. So that made me happy. But I was worried that the mealworms would grow back in my container because I didn't give her my container, I gave them to her in a different one because I wanted to keep those to house different bugs. So as I was worrying about this, something else happened to me that also plays a huge role in this story and it's this walnut. Now I never really buy walnuts in the shells, but this time I was like, let's try to grow them. So I opened my walnut and found the brother of the mealworm chilling inside. Thank goodness heckin' I didn't eat these things, otherwise that would have been in my stomach. And guess what? I got so excited that it could possibly be another caterpillar, but probably it was the mealworm brother's cousin. So I put it in its grow box, a different one, separate from the other ones. And right now I'm waiting to see if anything happens to it. It's chilly now with the mealworms beside their animal kingdom. So I did find a bug on my strawberry that likely was a caterpillar, but instead of a butterfly, it grew into hundreds of mealworms that I now call my children. And I even helped a lizard gecko friend get some nice meals and Lenny is thriving. Now, since the butterflies didn't grow, at least I have milkweed host plants for monarch butterflies, wildflower annuals that attract pollinators, knowledge of how to kill aphids with a family of ladybugs, which we're probably gonna do this summer. We're gonna need to try that out so maybe we'll have a ladybug kingdom this summer. And we also got a happy Venus flytrap plant and a little baby walnut bug that's currently still growing and morphing into its life stages. I will ensure that the butterfly I grow will be absolutely bougie because you can bet your bottom that we're gonna be very determined to get my hands on a caterpillar so I can grow an actual baby butterfly. So this summer, I'm gonna go foraging every single weekend or every damn day until I find a caterpillar that I bring with me to grow into a butterfly and I already know they like to eat carrot plants, okay? And I have lots of those. And it's gonna grow into a butterfly and I'm gonna get all the milkweed and wildflowers and all the leaves will be ready to house their eggs and it'll be awesome. This just goes to show that that not everything works out the way we want it to or expect it to. And even though this didn't really go as planned and we didn't grow a butterfly yet, we did learn a lot about other species in nature. And as for the mealworms, I still don't really know what to do with these heckin' things. But I guess I'll keep them as my children for now. Or for now and always. There's no escaping the left-hand corners anymore. We took this coconut and placed it in this bucket of water so that we could sprout it and grow a coconut plant. Well, this is the story of what happened. We placed the coconut in the water for 24 hours, added a little plate on top so the coconut would stay submerged. I had to try with a couple of plates. I had to get the sizing right. The bigger the better. And when I tell you 24 hours never took so long, I say it because I was so excited to grow a coconut. And if you're new here, you might not know, but we actually got a sprout. This indeed is a success. Story. I couldn't believe it, but this story is far from over. Well, after 24 hours, the day passed and we removed our soaked coconut from that bucket of water, got a damp baggie and placed the coconut right inside. I made sure the eyes were facing down, I sealed it up, and a few weeks finally passed. I thought 24 hours was long. A few weeks was like an eternity. Anywho, as I was waiting for those few weeks to pass, I realized that the coconut floats in water because it has milk inside of it. You need this milky goodness in order for the sprout to grow. Make sure it's got that liquid, that good soup. But finally, a few weeks passed. I went to check on our coconut to find something special. A baby sprout was emerging from the coconut. I took it out of the bag to examine it to make sure that it was actually a sprout because at this point I wasn't even really sure. I thought maybe three sprouts would emerge from each eye, but I guess only one sprouts out. But of course, I'm still learning as I went along this process. It was pretty gooey and it felt really weird, but I made the final call that this was indeed a sprout. I have no idea how coconuts grow, but as I put the coconut back in its baggy home, I I realized that coconuts are just seeds. They've got eyes, tails, and the stem grows out of the eye.
dies, the roots grow out of the tail. And apparently it's hard to grow coconuts that have the husk removed, but we try what is difficult. The fool does think he is wise, but the wise man knows himself to be a fool. Anywho, had to keep it damp. The coconut was looking great. It wasn't growing that much, but it wasn't shrinking either. So in my humble opinion, we were killing it at this point. I kept spritzing it religiously with water, but y'all, the sprout was a very slow to emerge more and more each week and by now it was about five or six weeks that had passed prime summer days passing by and i went to check on it to see that our coconut was literally gone as you know we have a rodent problem and this coconut absolutely did us dirty because y'all know those dang squirrels came and well ate it as upset as I was, I got a new coconut. It's all trial and error. <coughs> you should know that by now. I'm really sorry. But we got a new one and we did the same thing. We placed it in a baggie and we waited for the sprout and hear ye, hear ye. Some weeks passed and we sprouted a second one. And just wait, cause you're about to see that sprout and it grew bigger this time than the last. Of course, I religiously spritzed it with water to keep the co cocoa damp every three days. If you're doing this at home, you'll probably become a religious spritzer like me. And you're probably thinking, Oh, my lady grew a coconut plant. Well, a few weeks passed and we found ourselves a sprout. Be not afraid of greatness. I was so excited because I've been trying to grow coconuts for many years and it finally worked. And the difference was that I had a lot more sun. But it also did look kind of gross. I wasn't really sure what was going on over here. This one was a little less gooey than the other one, the sprout. So I was thinking, well, maybe we should place it in soil. But I figured I'll keep it in the baggie for a little bit longer so that it can grow a little bit more because at this point last year it was around August and it was starting to get a little wee bit colder in Canada so I knew that we would have to bring it inside soon had to be prepared for the better or for the worse I'm married to these plants just so you know well guys I went to check on it and I saw the little sprout had fallen out of the coconut oh my I didn't know what to do at this point I sat down and thought okay it's been three months of this and even though we know it's all trial and error we have to be a coconut plant parent well, this is what the coconut had looked like and it looked like it could potentially be sprouted inside So I was like, okay, either we continue to try and regrow this sprout or it's time to open up this thing and eat the sprouted marshmallowy goodness inside of the coconut and here's where you can actually eat your sprouted coconut too Because if you break it open, there's gonna be a white marshmallowy surprise in the middle We love surprises or you can grow it into a house plant like us or both But if you don't know what a sprouted coconut is as you watch me truly truly struggle to open this I promise I learned how to actually open a coconut for real by using the back end of the knife and banging it in the middle rather than a ratchet scenery from Maury Povich over here but <laughs> sprouted coconuts happen when the coconut sprouts inside and develops this marshmallowy goodness that you can consume and it tastes very very good and you can't buy that from the grocery store especially in Canada but clearly I learned the hard way that it takes a lot bigger of a sprout for this coconut to have a marshmallow inside and so I was basically out of luck here but you know what I had to do. I got another coconut to try sprouting it into a plant and of course to grow the sprouted marshmallowy goodness inside. I never give up you guys. I even bought two more coconuts, tried the experiments all over again but this time I also planted one straight in soil because I was truly determined to grow a coconut truly plant determined. and sprout the inside so that and I could eat it. Well just to let you know it never worked with these. <laughs> the best bet to grow a coconut plant especially if you're doing it at home is the initial way of submerging it in water, placing it in a baggie, waiting for the sprout to go and then planting it in soil once the sprout comes and do that before it falls out and you need a lot of sun so at this point I was a bit sad sure but realized okay it's fine summer's here in a month so we're gonna try again and until then I got a water coconut I wanted to see if I could open it drink the juice eat the mushy insides because there are many different types of coconuts that are shipped to stores in three stages the young coconut the medium young white coconut and the brown husked coconut filled with sweet milky liquid it's great for cooking the young one <laughs> but clearly this was a journey and a half it's clear that this coconut Coconut has me in a chokehold and it's not letting me go until we successfully grow a full plant and not this half sprout shit. But we did learn so much about growing coconuts, like how to actually sprout them to grow a plant, what a sprouted coconut is with the marshmallowy goodness inside, how to open a coconut pretty easily, how to deter squirrels and rodents from the garden, and so 
much more that really is just proof in the pudding that it's all trial and error and we should try what's difficult so y'all you know with me it is always a wild ride even though we didn't have a sprouted coconut and i was really confused of course we're gonna get a new coconut and try growing it I always wondered if you could grow a carrot from a carrot, but you can't. You can grow a plant that yields seeds that you can then plant to grow the real carrots. That was a mouthful, right? <coughs> well, allow me to explain. This is the story of carrot. At first, I thought that you could just grow carrots from carrots. So two years ago, I cut the top off of my carrot, placed it in a little cup of water, and it started to grow. I figured if you can grow potatoes from potatoes, they're both root vegetables, so it should be the same thing with carrots, right? <laughs> but I was wrong, because as this carrot started to grow, the top part started to grow first. Some of the days I forgot to continuously fill it with water, so I almost killed it, but we saved it. Then it began to develop roots at the bottom of the carrot top. We had to religiously change the water every three days. Once it grew roots, it was ready to move into a bed of soil so that the real carrots could grow. I was pumped when it looked ready for soil, so I put it in its new home, and I even made this garden box too, by the way. I'm a real plant lady. But anywho, if you know me, you know that plants are all trial and error. <coughs> and we don't always get lucky with our harvests, since we're in Canada and the winters are very harsh. We only have about three months to grow stuff from June to September. However, I planted the carrot in soil and I added a little label and some knives and forks. Basically, the forks help me tell the pests that try and feast on my carrot tops for their family of 17 squirrels to fork off. They help repel the animals that try and eat them because those animals don't like the sharp edges of the plastic cutlery like bunnies and squirrels. Soon, the carrot started to shoot up in the soil like a little boy going through puberty. And here's where you gotta be careful and where I actually ran into a little problem because caterpillars love to eat carrot greens. And one morning I went outside to see that there was a little green caterpillar on my plant and I don't have experience with caterpillars. I didn't think anything of it. I let the little guy feast away, but it ate those greens quick. And after only three days, I had to bring the caterpillar to a new home and I'm actually now really upset that I didn't take the caterpillar and grow it into a butterfly. But that's okay because I gave it a new home and this this year, we're gonna look out for more caterpillars that join the carrot plant garden so that we can grow them into butterflies. Anywho, after I gave the little caterpillar a new home, the plant started to grow back and eventually the flowers grew. I was looking at this plant thinking, what in the heckin' am I growing? This is not a am carrot I plant. Are carrots gonna grow? But then I realized that this was not just any flower. It was a flower that looked to house inside of it carrot seeds. I had planted carrots before and I kind of knew what they looked like and I was like, wait, these look like carrot seeds. So I took those flowers and I cut them off the plant. And I thought if I could plant those seeds, then I could surely grow my own carrots. And by the way, you gotta make sure that you wait until the flowers turn brown to cut them off because then they'll dry out much quicker and your seeds will be ready to plant or to save for next year because they last a long time. First, I dried the seeds out for a week in this little cup and trust me, I know what you're thinking. These seeds look like that good, good plant. Good. But trust me, it's not that type of good, good plant. I promise. We grow that too, but we can't really post about that. Anyway, but to learn that if you place a carrot top in water and then in soil, once it grows roots, it'll grow seeds that you can then plant to grow carrots was a hard fact that whipped my butt because this fact took me about a full year to learn. But if it taught me anything, it was even more exciting growing my own seeds and germinating my own little carrot tails to actually finally grow the carrot. See, it's not easy to find love. E now here's the thing about new love. You have to feed it even if it's a mistake of your past. And soon enough, Carrot was back on his feet, planted in a new pot, this time ready for real carrots to sprout. And I was just in time to plant those seeds for the summer since carrots only take about 14 weeks to grow. So, in order to actually plant these things, I figured I've got to remove these little spikes that surround the little seeds and then germinate those little seeds. And once they sprout little tails, they'll then be ready to plant in soil to grow into a plant that you can harvest real carrots from or you can save the seeds for next year since they last a few years. But finally, after germinating the seeds that I grew from the carrot top in the soil, I waited 12 weeks. 
And by the way, pro botanist tip is that fruits contain seeds while the vegetables contain all the other parts of the plant and can consist of roots, stems, leaves, bulbs. So technically something like a cucumber is a fruit, but a carrot is a vegetable. Well, anywho, you never know what could happen when you put your mind to something. Well, when I tell you that I've never been more excited for anything in my entire life, there is no cap there because this carrot started to grow. I even gave it optimal growing conditions and put it in my grow box. And as you can see, it it was doing amazing. Rafi loved the smell of it. I didn't allow him to eat them, but I repotted it. I put that outside. Luckily, we have a south facing balcony, and our carrot started to thrive. Remember, I'm not a religious carrot grower, so I don't really know when to pull it, but I figured let's let these leaves brown a bit and let's give it a go. Let's pull it out. By now, it was around October, and we all know that the winters in Canada are very harsh, and so I kind of had to pull it out of the soil because it was getting a bit too frosty outside. I was so excited for the carrot to pop out, but when I pulled it, I realized Dang. it's not ready. Look, I pulled the carrot out too early. I was convinced that it was ready, but you have to wait until the carrot green tops get brown. Just like how you need to wait until the flowers that hold the seeds get brown before cutting them off the plant and drying them. It's the same thing when you pull the carrots. But of course, I'm still learning this on the way, right? So I put it back in the soil for five weeks, hoping that the roots would reattach to the soil and grow a bit more, but feeling like I absolutely ruined my shot at growing homegrown carrots from the homegrown seeds. But a miracle took place because although they weren't too pretty, it worked. I figured, okay, wh what to do, what to do. Of course, I had to share one with my dog, but I figured let's make my world famous chicken soup recipe. Well, actually it's my mom's recipe and we'll add that carrot to it. I also figured I would plant the other carrot back in the soil again, cause it worked last time and they were kind of small. So I was hoping that they would grow again, but it, it never did. Honestly, they looked like little dancing humans. It was so funny and cute. But this also shows that I planted the seeds way too close to each other. So we're gonna learn for this upcoming summer. And here's where it really gets good. You know what I had to do from the garden to the plate? I started making the chicken soup. Guys, all I need to say here is good soup and the soup turned out amazing. This recipe is simple for you to use at home too for yourself and for your dog. I make this for us bi-weekly. You use a whole chicken, some carrots, onions, some garlic, some celery if you have. I didn't have any, so I chose to use potatoes and some ginger too. Once you have all of your ingredients ready, you gotta get a big pot. Oh yeah, you also wanna add onions. I had some enoki mushrooms in there but I didn't add them to the soup anyway got my pot put my chicken right inside fill that pot with water to cover the entire chicken see it bubbling up a little bit and then you want to peel all of your veggies get them cut up and ready to go add them to your pot and once you add all of your veggies I also added some lemon pepper I didn't add any salt because the chicken is already really salty in and of itself in the oils but then you start to boil it and once that chicken comes to a boil you simmer it for four hours I actually simmered it first six or seven hours by accident so the chicken was a little bit too boiled but then you got to take your chicken out of the soup peel out all the bones and then add the chicken back to the soup and then there's going to be a layer of oil on the top that you want to remove because you don't want to consume that once you successfully do that don't pour your oil down the sink either because it can harden your sink and clog it up so make sure you wait till that oil hardens and then you can throw it in the garbage but after this step your little doggy friend will be waiting it will be pretty much ready you can boil it for however long you want and the flavors will just just keep on coming, but the water will lessen and lessen after each hour that you boil it. So I ended up boiling it for another hour afterwards. Don't use chicken broth because we all know that the best chicken soup comes from the real chicken itself. Don't cheat here, okay? My mother taught me this. Taste test reveal was incredible. And I had all of these carrot tops left. So I called up my sister and I was like, hey, you're amazing at making pesto. Let's do a got into the plate with all of these carrot tops that I have. And she's like, come on over. Let's do it. So we took those carrot tops. We also took some basil. We took some garlic, some lemon. We took some red wine vinegar. We took some walnuts, some extra premium, extra virgin olive oil, really nice coarse salt, some seasoning. I think that was oregano. Parmesan cheese, then you're ready to go, blend it up. And once you give it a good blend, get your mint, add some mint in there, and then you're ready to go. But we didn't just eat this as normal pesto. We got a piece of nice sourdough bread from the market, put some nice churned butter, and then we put the pesto, and then we put some prosciutto. 10 out of 10 recommended. But my friends, that's the story of carrots. 
We all now know that you can grow seeds from a carrot, not the real carrots. So the fact that most root veggie tops you grow in water will only grow into a plant that yields seeds that you can then plant to grow into the crop is so cool. We learned so much about root vegetables, how to grow seeds, how to plant them, and how to actually yield vegetables that you can then use to make recipes like chicken soup and pesto and so many other yummy things. I do wish I kept that caterpillar, but that is okay because the summer's coming up quick. And Guarl, you already know it's always a wild ride with me. I took this old and moldy dragon fruit, placed it in a terracotta pot filled with soil so that I could see if I could grow a hundred baby dragon fruit cactus friends. Now normally we'd probably throw it away, but becoming a mother is way better than disposing of old and moldy fruit. And of course, I wouldn't make you wait because it's been one full year and we actually got a hundred baby dragons. This is a tale of triumph. Story of accomplishment. A chronicle of success. A legend of progress. So, it all started three weeks after planting that full moldy dragon fruit in the soil. When I planted it, I also added some perlite and vermiculite to the garden soil in the pot. That just helps allow the soil to breathe and it provides good aeration so our children can grow. Three weeks passed. Every morning I would go out to the garden. In fact, I would sprint. Religiously checking on our babies. One morning, I entered the garden to see this. We got one baby dragon growing. Success. I was so pumped. I was convinced we were going to have a full-blown desert outside our front door. But I was indeed quite confused because there are hundreds, if not thousands, of small, black, edible, crunchy seeds in a dragon fruit like the one that we planted. And as determined as I was to grow a hundred baby dragons, for some reason only one baby was growing and it wasn't getting very big. So you know what I had to do. I got another old and moldy dragon fruit to plant in soil. In fact, I got two of them. One purple and one white fleshed. I added those straight back to the soil where we were growing our one baby dragon. And as I got ready to add them to the soil, this terracotta pot became a whole ecosystem. There were some worms, some tiny bugs, those really freaked me out. But I figured the cycle of life will allow my little babies to grow. If this was me this year, you already know we would have taken those worms and created a mean, mean compost bin that collected the worm poop to make the soil even more perfect. But back then, I wasn't as experienced of a plant mother as I am now. So I just left the worms to chill in the soil with the baby dragons. Now we had four pieces of dragon fruit ready to go. I covered them with soil and I waited another four weeks. This time. What happened was absolutely astonishing. All right, let me tell you. A hundred baby dragons were growing. I was so excited, but it was raining a lot. So the soil was pretty damp. And I guess that meant that it was a very tasty. Because each day I went to check on our baby dragons, there seemed to be what looked like a hole in the soil getting bigger and bigger as the days passed. So much so that I realized that must not be the worms. It must be the squirrels. Some of the baby dragons were even gone. And if you don't already know, on this channel, we have a rodent problem. And I figured it was the squirrels coming and feasting on my babies for their families of 17. Because whenever you see one squirrel, there's like 20. At first, I wasn't really sure what to do. So I left it because I figured the cacti would grow their first little hairs, which are in fact quite spiky. So I figured maybe the spikes would help ward off the rodents. And at first it was doing really well. The babies were starting to grow up. But that was a mistake. I shouldn't have left it. Because one of the days I woke up to find the holes were even deeper and a lot of our baby dragons were gone. Even though I did thank the plant gods for leaving us with some of our children, I got to work to deter these rodents so that we could be successful and grow these a hundred baby dragons. Okay. I got some more soil. I filled in the holes and I even added some survival sticks, which are really just chicken souvlaki sticks that I put in the soil so the sharp edges of the sticks could be used to help scare off these squirrels. And guess what? Our baby dragons were doing well again. <laughs> but a few days later, I went to check on them and I guess those babies are truly tasty because most of them were in fact gone. You know that this year I learned from my mistakes and we're gonna deter those squirrels with mesh netting, greenhouses, garden boxes, and prickly railings. But you probably still already know what I had to do. I scrummaged in the soil for the remaining children and I rehoused them to bring them inside because I was determined as heckin to grow these things and hundreds of them. And plus it was getting pretty cold outside so at this point we had to bring them inside anyway if we wanted them to survive because we are in Canada and the winters are very harsh. I repotted them and I let them sit inside my grow box for a few months and this is what they started to grow into. I was very excited.
excited. But these things are very hard to keep alive. They're cacti, so they hold water in their leaves, and you have to be sure not to overwater these. I didn't even overwater them, and they were slowly but surely shrinking up like a little fruit going rotten. But you know me. I was determined as a heckin'. So I took these things and I repotted them. I added the little seedlings to two different grow boxes, and I gave them some nutrients, some kelp, some extra love. I even talked to them to give them energy, and they actually started to grow back really big. Y'all know it's because I was talking to them. And these ones were in fact bigger than the other ones I planted, and they were ready to be repotted into a new pot. So I did that when they outgrew the grow box. And now the other ones were smaller babies, and they were taking a little bit longer to grow. This was basically the five month progression of the second grow box dragon fruit that we tried to save and it was doing really well. Not all of them survived, but hey, it's a tough world out there. It seemed like a few were coming back from the dead. So like the others, I took it out of the grow box and I got ready to separate them into their own individual pots. They were looking really good for a few weeks. As time passed, they seemed to be shrinking like the other ones. And at this point, I didn't know what to do. I wasn't overwatering them. They were outside and had lots of sun. I was just confused. But I do not give up. And the initial dragon fruit that we planted in the pot was also shrinking up. I don't know, guys. But for some reason, I still wasn't happy. I really wanted 100 baby dragons that would grow actual dragon fruit. So you know what I had to do. I got an old and moldy yellow dragon fruit. It wasn't that old and moldy. But we got to work this time. Since I learned so much from the time before, I, I figured this time it's going to work really well. So I got my handy dandy utensil and I pricked the seeds out. I got them on a piece of damp paper towel in orderly fashion to germinate. Not Germany, but Germany. And soon enough, it grew some tails and it was ready to be planted in soil. I got a pot of soil, added some survival sticks that we all know and love, and planted the germinated seeds right inside. The yellow dragon fruits were growing so well, they were ready to be repotted and I was pumped. They were growing way faster than the purple ones. And the little seeds that germinated were a lot thicker. Girthy. So I separated them and got them each in a new pot. And a few more months passed. They were still thriving. And at this point, I had to bring them inside. But I had to make sure there were no bugs in the soil. So I got some dish soap. I diluted that in water. I soaked the roots so we didn't bring any pests inside. I do this with all the plants I bring inside. And you should too. So you repel bugs. I'm already growing hornworms and mealworms and silkworms. So we don't need more pests because right now they're controlled. Anywho. I had to prick some cactus out of my fingers as well because they got stuck after touching and it was kind of fun not gonna lie but any sudden movement it was like a jolt through my whole body but i got some cactus soil ready and i completed the mission now those babies are thriving and hopefully soon they're gonna grow some dragon fruits i don't really know how long that takes but i'll see you in 13 years however if you know anything about me i persevere and i try what's difficult and i'm not often happy with the results so after we did this i low-key got a dragon fruit obsession and i got an idea i figured maybe we can try to be creative and try growing a unique dragon fruit plant from the seeds inside of one of my drinks a dragon fruit pinkity drinkity so i ran to the shop i sprinted in fact we're getting used to this i removed all the seeds from the drink got them on a piece of damp paper towel and waited some weeks now i am aware that these seeds are freeze dried so there's a very low chance that they will grow but if we did this with the kiwi drink and we grew an actual kiwi plant and we try what's difficult then surely we can grow a dragon fruit cactus too there was actually some growth taking place in these little dragon fruit dehydrated seeds and I was in shock because I didn't realize this would be a thing. And we would grow a dragon fruit cactus from our drinks. But as the days went on, it did seem to shrink up a bit and it died. I'm very sorry. But I was still happy that I tried this because I now have a solid kiwi plant from my drink. And we're going to try this again until we grow a dragon fruit plant from our drink. So make sure to stay tuned on this one. By the way, if you want an easier way to extract your dragon fruit seeds along the way, I learned if you're doing it the traditional way, don't spend too much time picking out the seeds with your bare hands. Instead, just grab your dragon dragon fruit and a paper towel, cut a piece of your dragon fruit and pat the fruit down on the paper towel. That will remove a lot of your seeds and then you can just spritz the paper towel with water and grow your seeds without spending the two hours picking them off. Or you can be like me and do that because it's a little bit more fun in orderly fashion. But anywho, I had to taste this dragon fruit and then give some to everybody in the house. And this guy, he was working on the house. He didn't think it tasted like much. Oh, the really white one doesn't, but the yellow and the purple ones are much sweeter. So try those if you're eating dragon fruit. But along the way, I did learn something else. 
else. That, that there are dragon fruits that are actually called apple cacti and they have a smooth surface on the outside. They're often found in South America, but I was lucky enough to find one at a fruit market, so naturally, I had to open it for the first time and taste it to see what this buzz was all about because of course we all know that I love dragon fruits. I got an obsession. It was pretty cool though and it tasted really good. I will not lie. But this was honestly just a cherry on top for a year's worth of hard work growing a hundred baby dragons. So that, my friends, is the story of how one person's love for dragon fruits led them on a wild adventure. I dared to take on the challenge of growing not one, not ten, but a hundred baby dragons to call our own and what a journey it was. We started out with two old and moldy purple dragon fruits, one old and moldy yellow dragon fruit, one dragon fruit pinkety drinkety with the dehydrated seeds that we tried to grow, and a whole lot of dragon babies we now have as our children. That we quite literally birthed ourselves, okay? With just a little more time, they're gonna grow up. They're gonna sprout. They're gonna grow real fruit. And just so you know, dragon fruit plants get pollinated by nocturnal creatures on only one night of every summer. And after that one night, all the fruits sprout up, so we gotta make sure we're ready for that one night of the summer. Right now, I'm getting ready to bring these plants back outside since summer is now here in Canada. So don't forget to come back for updates on our dragon fruit progress. And remember, try what's difficult because it's all trial and error. Where will this journey take us next? Eating the dragon fruits that we grow. What is inside of Mexican jumping beans? I got my hands on five to find out. These things are found in Mexico and they are small bean pods of a host flower of a plant. That bean hardens and then falls to the ground and then some magical circumstance makes these things pop on the floor. And they don't stop for a long time. Who needs a clock when you got jumping beans? What is going on here? I've never opened up one of these things before, so I decided to open one out of the five beans to find out what's inside. I got my tweezers ready to crack one of these things open and carefully started opening up the seed. And that is when I saw something moving. It looked like there was a caterpillar living in there. And that must be why I hear tick 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 all day. Well listen, it's a good thing that it's a hobby of mine to hatch ladybugs and butterflies. This one was a morning cloak butterfly and Rafi's best friend. But seriously, hatching butterflies is like the coolest thing ever. She flew away. It's a good thing I hatched butterflies before because after I opened this bean, I thought if this is a larvae, it'll grow into a butterfly and maybe we can have a pet moth butterfly. Just look how cute this tiny little creature looks inside its home. Cause listen, if you tell me to grow a pet moth, I'm growing a pet moth. And I was wondering how these things even survive in there since the little beans are such a tiny environment for the small little creature to thrive in. And I was also wondering how they consume their food if they're stuck inside a tiny little bean. Where do they get their food? But then I learned that the larvae primarily consume the nutrients present in the seed, and that's their food. So this feeding activity triggers the movement of the jumping bean, and that's what makes them jump. How cool is that? A tiny little creature can survive in a natural symbiotic relationship with the host plant's seed. Then it all made sense to me, because I saw the little larvae moving around, eating those little hair-like structures on the bean, and I could not believe what these jumping beans did after I opened them. Because yes, they do eat the little hair-like structures, structures on the bean, but they also apparently try to weave a net around the part of the bean that I opened to actually close the structure all together. It's basically telling me that I should have left these beans closed because these little caterpillars actually wanted to stay inside. The little creature started to close up the bean with this webbing-like material and essentially what it is doing is producing silk threads using special glands in their bodies, which are primarily used for three things. One, to create insulated shelters to stay warm in colder temperatures. Two, to secure a protective place to stay out of harm's way from potential creatures who can eat them like squirrels and bunnies. Three, helping their little bodies to maneuver inside the bean more easily once it's fully closed so that they can begin their metamorphosis process from a tiny larva into a butterfly moth chrysalis. That's just what they emerge out of as their adult with the wings. And at this point, I thought, well, maybe these things are silkworms. But I learned that they are actually not silk moths. They are house moths. So these silk threads that they produced cannot be used for human purposes, like the silk obtained from silkworms is. But I bet you, if you had enough of this webbing, you could still make things out of it. But apparently the webbing from the house moth is a lot weaker than that of the silk from the silk moths. And listen, silk moths are a whole other topic that I'm gonna eventually get into because the process of making silk is out of this world and we need to see a silk factory soon, so stay tuned for that. But it is a fact that the silk threads that the house moths produce to close the bean that I opened 
do in fact play a vital role in their survival. So I just let them be. But after a few weeks, I started to wonder if opening more of the beans would put the larvae to work and help them hatch faster. I did get five beans and only opened two of them, so I left the other three closed so that we can see how they do in fact hatch once they're at that stage in the metamorphosis. I'm not exactly sure how long it'll take for them to hatch, but from my past experiences with butterflies, I think it'll take four to 12 more weeks. And I've got a time-lapse camera going on them daily just in case they do hatch because we gotta get that on camera. Listen, nature is so weird. Just maybe I'll make a silk sweater or maybe Raph will get a nice new snack. I know we're all so fascinated by these jumping beans, so I thought I'd give you a bit more information on how the little larvae even get inside of the bean to begin with and why and how weird nature makes that happen. So we already know that the little larvae lives inside the bean and that's why they jump. But when they're warmed up, by heat from the sun or heat from body temperature, like from holding the beans in your hands for a few minutes, the larvae inside starts to wiggle and bounce, and they bounce from one spot to another freely as a way of surviving. But how the actual larvae gets inside is another situation. Essentially, what happens is female house moths lay their eggs on the flowers of the shrub called Sebastian Pecconiana. And when the flowers dry up, they turn into seed capsules and the eggs get deposited right inside. As the eggs hatch and the larvae begin to grow inside of that tiny bean, movement is created by contracting and relaxing and eating, making the bean jump. The moth larvae typically stay inside the bean until they reach maturity, and once they're fully developed, the adult moth chews a small hole through the bean's outer shell, emerging as a moth and flying away to continue its cycle. This is where we're gonna see the different process of hatching, three beans with no openings, and two beans with a silk webbing to exit through. That exit hole is usually near one of the bean's ends, and the only thing left for the moth to do once it emerges from its chrysalis is to find a mate and start the process anew. It really is kind of beautiful that the moth exits the bean when it's ready to move on to the next stage of its life as a moth butterfly, and it has somewhere safe to live in the interim. Now we've got to wait for these things to hatch so that we can learn more about the life cycle of jumping beans, and so we can finally have our pet moths. So till then, I really went to the trees to see if any beans were jumping at the base. Didn't find any. But all in all, maybe, just maybe, we should have left these things closed, but I'm still happy we opened them, so stay tuned for more jumping bean videos coming soon. I never thought it would be illegal to grow a pink pineapple, but it is because they're patented. Technically, if I'm not selling them, I'm good to grow the seeds inside. So I did that because I wanted to see if the seeds from the pink pineapple would grow into a yellow pineapple or not. And it worked! So this is the story of our pineapple plant. And yes, pineapples have seeds. So it all started with me sitting in my house thinking about the fact that only fruits have seeds and pineapples aren't vegetables, so they must have seeds somewhere, right? <gasps> so I started searching for the seeds and I found them right underneath the rind. Of course, I immediately stood there questioning my whole existence as a plant mother because there I was, not realizing that pineapples have seeds that you can grow and they come in pink? And no, that is not in fact pineapple wagyu, but you can go to jail for trying to grow those? Well, upon further research, I learned that pink pineapples are trademarked, so you can't grow the top crowns at home, meaning someone has literally bought a label for these pineapples so that you cannot grow them or sell them yourself. But if you're at all familiar with this channel, we always find ways to grow the difficult fruits. At first, I was scared that the pink pineapple seeds wouldn't grow, so I went ahead and also got a nice fat yellow pineapple to also try germinating the seeds in those. I thought of it as a little experiment to see if the pink or the yellow ones would sprout if at all. And if you're lucky, you'll find up to 100 seeds in your pineapple, but some like this one only came with about 10. Some grocery store pineapples are genetically modified though, so they might not have seeds, but everyone that I've opened so far has had the seeds even from the store. Actually, every part of the pineapple can be used to grow more pineapple, and it takes about two years to fruit, but if you grow from seed like us, it can take up to six years. So I'll see you in 13 so years, in 13. but I germinated the seeds on a damp piece of paper towel for four months. 
I kept checking on them for the first two months, religiously spritzing them with water every three days. But, admittedly, I forgot about them for another two months. Four months had passed and I opened the paper towel to find two baby sprouts emerged. So we took them, we admired them, and they even looked like little baby cute pineapples sitting right in my hand. And guys, I was still learning as I went along with all of you. So I didn't know what would happen, but it was safe to say this chokehold loosened a little bit. They're so cute. I could have also probably sprinkled cinnamon on the seeds to help promote growth of the other one since we only got two, but we got two. So we planted those in soil and they sat there for many months. Now, as they sat there, I wasn't sure if the pineapple seeds would have a high success rate in germination. And not only did I try with the seeds, which did seem to be doing pretty well in their home, but I low key also got a pineapple obsession and I wanted to try what other ways I could try sprouting a pineapple. Especially since I learned in Hawaii that every part of the pineapple can be used to grow more pineapples. So you know me, I got a few other pineapples, 11 to be exact, and I figured let's try unwrapping the leaves and planting it in soil to see if we can grow a little baby pineapple. There were little roots already sprouting out of it. It was really cool. I planted it straight in soil and now it's been there for about one year. This is a little bit of the progression. Guess what else was starting to get bigger, fatter, and cuter? Not me. Okay. Maybe just the cuter, but the pineapple. The pineapple started to grow. I made sure to repot it when it outgrew its pot, which you should do too if you're doing this at home. When I pulled it out of the pot, we saw our first sign of success. Well, actually, the second next to the actual leaves getting bigger, there were roots on the bottom of the soil. At this point, it was about October, and I had to bring this plant inside in the winter. We're in Canada. So I got some dish soap, diluted it in water, soaked the roots. That basically just helps remove any bugs or pests from the soil. So that I I didn't bring any inside. I'm already growing mealworms Mar and uh, hornworms Mar on the side here, so we don't need any more pests inside. Right now, they're controlled. When you do this dish soap thingy, it can shock your roots, so you might want to add some Epsom salt, some magnesium back to the soil when you replant it in its new pot. And although it hasn't grown too much since I brought it inside, it hasn't died. It's waiting for the summer sun to let it grow because right now it's sitting in its macrame hanger with the harsh winters of Canada just about to be gone. I think as soon as I put it back outside in a couple weeks, it's gonna thrive. I prayed and in hope that the squirrels wouldn't come and devour this plant when I put it outside for the family of 17 and we were good. They didn't come. And what happens is the pineapples grow right in the middle of your plant. Little baby pineapple, just one, will grow. Both out of the seed that we're growing and the crown that we planted in soil. And I know, I know, it's much easier to just cut off the crown and plant it in soil. There's a higher chance of success and it'll grow a lot quicker but of course you already know we try was difficult my friend but this process was far from over because this pineapple still had me in a chokehold it was not releasing me until I successfully grew a baby pineapple I was determined as heckin to grow a pineapple and fast too and in Canada and I knew a pineapple would take many years to sprout from the seed that we sprouted and I figured you know I told you I got 11 pineapples what I did with the next one was take the pineapple remove the leaves and you could see there were sprouts already coming out of the stem but this time I figured let's see if the propagation method works remember I tried these experiments so you don't have to and again guess what else was starting to get bigger fatter and cuter not me okay, okay maybe just the cuter but the pineapple for the first month or so it seemed to be thriving as the week started to pass it seemed like it was starting to get pretty moldy pretty squishy and I think that was a result of not having enough sun and working indoors even with the grow lights this thing did not grow for the life of me and i was kind of sad because those roots definitely had room to grow it's kind of like an ex-boyfriend who constantly disappoints you but you can't help but go back until you find a better dude to take care of you will ya i'm looking for the better pineapple to take care of me and release me from this chokehold so obviously you know i had to get another pineapple there's no such thing as giving up on this channel as you know we persevere until we get it right or at least until we learn something so that we can try again to get it right. 
lesson. If you're not always constantly learning, then you're probably not moving forward. But if you're moving forward, then it's probably constantly two steps forward and one step back and upwards progression. But it can't always be smooth sailing. Anywho. This time I moved apartments to a south facing one instead of a north, but I had more sun. Still, I was curious to see if this would germinate on a piece of saran wrap. So I got a piece, peeled all the leaves off, and I spritzed the saran wrap religiously three times a week to keep it damp. This one was not sprouting as much as the others. Well, that was a fail to swim up. But as I was going along this process, I learned something as we saw in the beginning of this story. That there are not just yellow pineapples, but there are pink ones too, and they're patented. The fact that people even patent food is dystopian to me. Like, how gutless can you be? So you can't grow them, at least for wholesale, but there's nothing stopping us from growing them, okay? Most pink pineapples don't even come with the tops because they cut them off before selling them. So technically, if they come out with a new 2.0 version of this pineapple that deliberately makes it so they come in seedless varieties, we'll all know how that happened. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Listen, if PepsiCo tried to take down farmers in India back in 2019 for growing their special variety of potatoes used for their Lay's chips and Pepsi lost, don't come at me. Anyhow. Listen, you may not know, but I traveled the globe far and wide to obtain a second pink pineapple so I could pink the seeds out with my bare hands for two hours and clearly I got way too many pineapples. But if you're anything like me and you want to know more about what in the heck can makes these things pink, well, the pink color comes from the presence of a natural pigment called lysopene. Excuse my pronunciation. But lysopene is a pigment that gives fruit its color. The same gene is found in tomatoes, red peppers, watermelons, so it makes it pink. It is also found in yellow ones, but a lot higher levels. However, scientists lowered the levels and they were able to breed pink ones. And if you're wondering about the taste, the pink pineapple is way sweeter, it's less acidic than the yellow ones, and personally, I liked it a lot. It was a weird version of a watermelon and a cantaloupe hybrid. However, I do want to inform you that I learned from you guys, actually that apparently even if the pink pineapple seeds do sprout they will not grow true to the pink color because they won't have the beta carotene pigment in them since they're a product of hybridization and so they're gonna have different genetics that was a mouthful i understand that was a mouthful. but I'm really not sure. I guess that's why I wanted to try it. I wanted to see if the seeds from the pink pineapple would grow into a yellow one or not. As we wait to find out, this is not yet over. I wasn't satisfied enough with these results. So I got one last pineapple. This time, I took the leaves off, and instead of just propagating the stem crown in water, I thought, well, maybe those leaves could have a chance at sprouting. So I took those individual leaves, and I placed them in a little container of water, and I waited some weeks. I figured maybe roots would grow out of the little leaves, but I'm sorry to inform you that it did not grow. However, this is why we try experiments, so you don't have to. Okay, I know I said that was the last one, but I got one last pineapple. Not to grow it, even though we did put the top in soil just in case, but to cook with it. From the garden to the plate. My brother was home, so I wanted to make him something nice to eat. I took the pineapple and I cut it up. I placed it in the oven for 30 minutes at about 400 degrees, and then I took it out and I gave some to my brother, and we tasted it. It tasted like a sweet dessert. Highly recommend. 9.3 out of 10. Then I had all of this pineapple skin and rind, and I didn't know what to do with it. So I called up my sister. I said, hey, what's up? You have a mean <clears throat> juice. Let's make some juice. She said, definitely. Naturally, I drove over there. I sprinted, in fact. Got the equipment ready, added it all, and I really said to my sister, when life gives you pineapples, make pina coladas. And she said to me, okay, I guess today we're making juice and in nine months pina coladas because I'm pregnant. And I said, okay, no problem. I'll drink it alone. Anyway, I guess we don't have to resort to pina coladas because this pineapple is growing. It's got me staying up singing that tune at night. It's got the juice. We really did start out with 10 yellow pineapples. I think it was 10, it could have been 11. There were also two pink pineapples in addition to that. It sprouted the seeds in one, grew the crown in the other, and it's sitting in soil waiting to go outside for the summer. We tried propagating some, sprouting the actual leaves in water, germinating a crown on saran wrap, tasted two pink pineapples and tried to grow them. We made some nice baked pineapple for that sweet tooth. We all have no in love. And some nice juice. Thank Thank you so much for coming along this journey with me. You don't have to tell me twice that I am a perseverer. We pick ourselves back up until we grow those dangin' heckin' fruit plants.
at least two out of these 10 pineapples are for sure growing. I'm positive that we're gonna have a baby mini pineapple. I made my own 3D printer filament from plastic water bottles at home and it's way harder than I thought, but I did it. And I can 3D print with my old water bottles now. How? Let me show you. I heated my bottles to melt the texture off and I made sure the caps were closed so the air could expand. And once they were smooth, I cut the tops off. And then the real test came, trying out my 3D printed bottle cutter. It worked, but not great. So it's a good thing I also bought one just in case. And this took me about 95 hours to figure out because the plastic just kept breaking on me. But the trick was to go slow and cut it on a 45 degree angle. And finally, we had strips. And see, that's the face of satisfaction. But once I had strips, I was ready to start extruding the strips through this machine that I built by hand. Just keep watching. I got my machine and my strips ready and I started attempting to push them through. I knew I was gonna have to figure out how exactly I would be able to pull the melted filament out through the other end of the nozzle, but I reminded myself that we aren't burning the plastic, just getting it heated enough so that it can stretch and become a different shape. But I kept running into some issues as the filament just kept melting and I tried for a long time. I was getting a bit worried that I was never gonna figure out how to melt the strips for the life of me, but with the idea in mind that we just had to trust the process, I kept trying. The problem was that I just couldn't get the filament to wrap around my mechanical pulley because it was just too hot coming out of that extruder. I thought maybe it could be the size of the strip, so I tried cutting the strips even smaller to see if they would fit in that way. And there I went, pushed it through, but I just ran into the same problem. But you guys are the best and you gave me the best tip ever, which was to lower the temperature. And I'm telling you, I tried this for days one by one, setting the temperature higher, lower, higher, lower, and finally, I came to the realization that the sweet spot temperature was between 75 and 80 degrees, but I just had to figure out the exact number in between so that the filament would stretch out through the other end the way it was supposed to. I was beside myself. I felt like a mad scientist who couldn't achieve anything right, but I persisted. And it didn't matter how many days or months this would take me, I was determined to figure this out so that we could 3D print from our old water bottles turned filament and save all the turtles in the world. With this epic form of recycling, the possibilities are endless for what we can print for the outdoor garden and the indoor plants. So I slept on it and woke up with a fresh mind determined to succeed. And when I woke up, I was so excited. I realized I had never had a project that excited me as much as this one other than growing plants and fruits and veggies of course but I started the trek for the day all the way up to the summit of 3d printing from plastic waste and turned my machine on to try again and as I was waiting for it to turn on I started to freak out because after about 10 minutes it wouldn't heat up I reached yet another impasse and I was beside myself because at this point I had come so far I had figured out how to melt the texture off my water bottles and cut them into strips which was already tough because it took me a while to get the strips even in width so they could fit in my machine and extrude out the other side of the nozzle as filament that I could then 3D print with. And the only thing left to figure out was getting the temperature right so that I could pull the filament right out of the nozzle with pliers. But of course, this project doesn't come without problems every step of the way because now I also had to figure out how to get my machine back in order and working again. So I proceeded to spend the next eight straight hours trying to eliminate the problem, you know, process of elimination. And that turned into four days. I'm literally doing this for eight hours at the moment of truth. Please. I basically rewired the entire thing, this diode, this heat wire, this power supply, this thermometer, this controller board. Oh my god. But there's this loop that connects these two and I noticed in the picture that eight was backwards and the way that I was looking at it was forwards and I'm like does this thing, does it really matter if that thing is flipped or not? Maybe I tried flipping it, rewiring it, and then it came back on. And now I have to figure out if the temperature is back working up. Holy. Nothing is working. I'll let you know though. I see the temperature here looking like it's slowly rising. This is the heat wire. 
I have to attach it in here. Oh, it just touches it. I messed this up because I was taking the whole thing apart and trying to find my mistake. And then when I turn it on, I'm getting the LLL signal below. See, and now the temperature is just decreasing. So we have all of our plastic. And now it's just a matter of getting it right so that I can actually melt it. And I think I was able to narrow down the problem to this ceramic heat hot end red wire that fits into my square element and sends heat signals to it. And if it's not that, then it's the controller board connector wire that needs changing. And hey, I grow plants, okay? I'm not an electrician. But listen, I do finish what I start, or at least I always try to, and after four full days of trying to figure this out, I was sure that I eliminated the problem. I had to order more wires and wait, and I was upset. I literally don't know what happened. It was working perfectly on Monday, and now it's not. So, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Well, I'm gonna try to fix this. That's what I'm gonna do. So of course, not only was I becoming an electrician, but to help solve that problem, I also joined this Facebook group for others building this machine too, and I met such unbelievable acquaintances who have been so willing to help me. This is Bernard from Montreal, Canada. Hi, Jesse. Hi, everyone. I'm helping Jesse on her filament maker project as she's running into some issues. And this is Guilame from the UK. I really hope I said your name right, and I'm so sorry if I didn't. But if you're wondering how I met those individuals, and what this machine is even called. It has a name and no, I didn't make it up. It's known as the Pedimentor. There's a group of about 5,000 of us all building the same one and we communicate in a Facebook group. It's pretty awesome. And a lot of us run into similar issues that we can help each other with. There's this one guy who created the group and he has YouTube videos that you can watch to build it. Or you can just subscribe to me and I'll tell you how to build it at home next week. But my boys Bernard and Guilame both helped me to narrow down my issue and they showed me also a better thermometer for the top of my machine that'll read the temperature more accurately when I get the machine fixed and ready to melt again. And listen, it was starting to feel like a huge trek of a mountain that I was climbing, even though I could see the summit right there. So I took a break and got my first haircut in about four years and then got back to work. I was really hoping I was right about the heat wire because I ordered more and patiently waited for the next seven hours by my front door for their arrival. And let me tell you, I was losing sleep over how much finding the problem was occupying my mind. But did I fix it? Well, once the wires arrived, I sprinted to my machine and got to rewiring the red hot end heat wire. And after a few hours of work, the moment of truth for me to turn the machine back on came to see if we got the problem. This is the moment of truth. I exchanged the wire. The moment of truth came to turn the machine back on to see if we got the problem. It didn't work. At first, I thought it wasn't working and I was stumped, but I was too eager. Wait, 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 hang on. Oh my God, guys, it's going down. Let me make sure the temp settings are good. Hot, 0.189, yes. <laughs> As I patiently waited for another five minutes, I saw the numbers going down and down and then up and up and finally I touched the machine to see if it was hot. Is it heating? <gasps> yeah, it's definitely heating. Probably a bad idea. And what do you know? Problem eliminated. I fixed the machine and I couldn't believe it. I was so proud of myself and felt like I was learning so much along the way about a topic I had no clue about. And I realized it's honestly amazing what you can do when you set your mind to learning. I not believe that I fixed that. That took me four full days. Now I just have to get one of my neighbors to help me drill a 1.7 millimeter hole into this nozzle. This one, my old one, I can't get out of this for the life of me. I heat it. I warmed it. If you got any tips, let me know. If I could just twist this out, I could twist it into the other one, rebuild my little platform, and then turn it on and melt filament. Let me see what I can do. I'm gonna do my best to get the drill. We're back at it. We're back in action. So, now that I fixed the machine, I only had one more thing I needed to do before turning my plastic into filament, which was drilling more holes in the nozzles just in case I burnt more of them out or clogged them up. I don't have a drill yet. I ordered a pink one, it's on its way, do not worry, but my neighbor in the interim stepped up to the plate. <laughs> my neighbor Mohit is here, our savior for the day. Oh. Oh. That was quick. That went. Yeah. Okay. Let's try this, maybe it's in alignment. There you go. We stand Mohit. And now I was ready to turn the machine back on and start the attempt at figuring out how to exactly melt the plastic properly. 
Okay, that says E4. That's okay though. We're not gonna rely on that so much. My thermometer still showed an error code E4, but as long as we follow the controller board temp on the bottom, we don't technically need the thermometer on the top, and I was more focused on actually figuring out how to melt the plastic and then fixing the other problems that didn't need to be fixed first. But most importantly, we were back in action, baby. It was a long day. I called it a night and woke up the next morning determined as ever to figure out the exact temperature I needed to melt successfully. I was really nervous because I did not want my filament to just melt everywhere like the first 200 hours I spent trying to melt it and I didn't want my machine to break down on me again. We are currently trying to melt some plastic. Let's see if we can get her done. So I have my filament on the pulley. Let's go to 60. If that doesn't work, then we'll go all the way up to 70. Here goes. At first, I tried what I had already tried, turning the machine on and pushing the plastic through the nozzle, where I then pulled it through the other side. And once again, that did not work. It's still not hot enough. I know it was too hot when it was at 86. It's a matter of trial and error until we get the right temp. This is not easy. Now we're at 70. Now let's see if it works. Nope. Come on. Nope. Okay. Okay, now we're gonna try going up to 80. Let's see if it works. It kept melting and it wouldn't firmly stretch out the other side. I tried using different plastic material. I tried bending the plastic and then pushing it through. Oh, there it is. Okay, getting somewhere. It's melting a bit. It should be able to go right through. There we go. That gave me an inkling of hope. Go ahead. Oh, that might be a little bit too hot, but it's not coming out through the other end. So we know that 80 is too hot. I don't know why I can't get this part right. But to be honest, I just sat there for another five hours failing, accumulating a lot of little tiny balls of green and blue plastic on the floor until I knew I needed to try something different if I wanted to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Oh, see, that's too hot. And if I lower the temp, then it doesn't come out properly. Would one degree really make that much of a difference? Okay, fine, I'll put the temp up a little bit more then. Ay, ay, ay. Plus, I knew it was possible because I had seen other members of the Pedimentor group successfully do this. So I contacted Bernard, he gave me some more tips. But really, I realized that this part was really up to me to figure out all alone. Not yet the mother of turtles. <sighs> but I kept going. Oh my god, this is the best filament we've seen yet. Push, 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 push. Go, 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 go. Get in there. And I finally figured out what I was going to try next. Every time I think we're getting somewhere, and it just won't pull through. It's not working. I just want to make filament. Just keep going. Just keep going. Trust the process. I'm trying one last time for today, and then I give up for today. So I thought I would try poking the plastic through the hole a different way this time. Instead of turning the machine on and then trying to melt the plastic through, I figured I'd try cutting a thin piece of plastic. See, it's so weird. I was promising. And then extruding it before I turned the machine on and once it was through, then turning the machine on so that by the time the temperature reached about 78.5, then I could seamlessly pull the plastic through the other end of the nozzle. Which by the way is the attempt I figured out worked. Okay. And that idea sounded easy, but putting it to the test was the utmost stressful part. <sighs> Guys, I have no idea what I'm doing. My fingers are hurting me. Was it gonna work? Were we gonna become the mother of all turtles? Well, I called it a night, woke up in the morning, and I was sure as heck and ready to insert this filament before heating it up and then pulling it. Let's go. And what do you know? After some trial and <clears throat> if not many, many attempts, I am a genius. 79.5 seemed to be the sweet spot. Because it worked. Just call me MacGyver. And I was having so much fun pulling it through the nozzle. Just look at that forbidden spaghetti. But seriously, this is a huge win. Let's go. But it was not over yet. Then I had to attach my filament to my pulley, which I did figure out how to successfully do, but my pulley wouldn't work properly. So I had to manually roll my filament onto my puller and I went at it for hours. I will surely get the kinks worked out in due time. And I also plan on making my machine better to optimize the automatic performance of it so I don't have to do this all by hand for hours and hours and days and days. But what felt like a victory, a win in a pool of losses, I actually did it. 
I made it to the top of the mountain and the summit's view down below showed me all of the turtles that I'm about to save in the ocean. Well, I went at this for a long time until I had enough filament to see if I could print something with it. But really I took a moment to appreciate how success feels and how it feels to never give up. And slowly but surely, I had like three different pulleys of about eight different water bottles that I melted and turned into filament. So I was really nervous to actually get it in the printer and see if it would print something. I was quite literally amazed that I did this and look how good it turned out. This can literally fit right into the 3D printer. So I guess you can pretty much imagine that I sprinted about less than a meter to my 3D printer and I was a little bit nervous, okay? I'm sure you are too. <laughs> but the forbidden spaghetti was ready to be printed. I got the filament wrapped on my 3D printer pulley and inserted our fresh new plastic water bottle filament slowly into the printer. Had my STL files turned into G-code ready for the printer to print and press start. But of course, each step in this process don't come without problems because the filament it just wouldn't come out of the printer for the life of me. So now, I just have to figure out the right speed, flow rate, and temperature settings to print water bottle plastic in my 3D printer, which will probably take me another 200 hours, but you can bet your bottom that we are not giving up until we successfully print at least one turtle, and eventually I wanna do something even more epic with all the water bottles I turn into filament, so if you've got any ideas of what I should do, comment below. I'm only gonna choose the biggest and the best ideas, but for now, just Call me the mother of all turtles in the ocean because we are saving their bums. So make sure to come back for updates, like, comment, subscribe, and remember that usually on this channel we take the seeds from inside exotic fruits and turn them into full-blown houseplants that fruit, but today, well after a few months actually, we successfully turned a plastic water bottle into filament so that we can 3D print awesome things for the indoor plants and outdoor garden, but most importantly, save all the turtly turtles. This is the most epic form of recycling and probably the coolest thing I've ever done in my entire life, so thank you so much for being a part of this process, for believing me, for supporting me, for commenting all your loving and awesome things. It makes me really happy and I enjoyed reading them all and responding throughout the entire journey of accomplishing this. This is definitely something you can do at home. I'm so excited to see how many of us that we can get to the ultimate level of sustainability. I've always been curious about this fruit, so I got one to make some candy and to experiment with the seeds to see if I can germinate them and grow a plant. This is a soursop, otherwise known as a guanabana or a custard apple. It tastes like a cacao pod in a Monstera Deliciosa fruit hybrid, but it's not to be confused with the Chiramoya because they're different fruits, but both oh. equally as custardy and tasty. I took the dark, spiky green fruit and opened it up to reveal probably one of the best fruits I've ever tasted, hands down, something out of this world. Oh my, god. Oh my god. A few more days and it wouldn't have been right. The inner juicy flesh has a custard-like texture and dark, oval, shiny seeds that I removed from their custardy outer fruit layer. Now this will take a while. Peels off like meat. It's like a corn on the cob. Got them on a piece of damp paper towel and the waiting game for them to germinate begun. Soursop is the name most commonly used in English speaking countries and guanabana is the name used in Spanish speaking countries. And since it's a famous ice cream flavor, I wanted to make some homemade guanabana soft candy with just two ingredients and of course grow the seeds. Well in just two weeks, these little seeds sprouted tails. So I planted it in soil and waited for our soursop plant to grow. I love that this fruit is a really popular ingredient in ice creams, other desserts, different beverages, and it's even used in traditional medicine, most known for its antioxidant properties, high vitamin C, and even its antiparasitic effects and antimicrobial properties against various bacteria and fungi. I wish it was more popular in Canada, but I guess it's just hard to grow and hard to import while keeping the fruits ripe. Well, I went to check on our soursop guanabana plant and I noticed it was growing pretty slowly. And at this point, I had heard about something called the chirimoya and how it's a fruit that's very similar to soursop with a few key differences. So of course I had to get my hands on one, but not just to taste it, to germinate the seeds and grow it into a plant. Even though soursop and chirimoya taste the same, they're actually 
actually two completely different fruits. Soursop has a spiky green exterior with soft spines or bumps. The surface may appear irregular and prickly, whereas Chirimoya has a more uniform green and scaly appearance. The skin is generally smoother compared to Soursop, and they usually fit in the palm of your hand, whereas Soursops are a lot larger. I opened it up to reveal the inner custardy flesh and removed the dark, tiny seeds. The seeds of the Chirimoya are slightly smaller than that of a Soursop, but I germinated the seeds, and after eight weeks, they were large enough to plant in soil, so I got the seedling in a new little home and the waiting game yet again begun. I was really fascinated by soursop fruits because of the weird spiky outer layer and the delicious taste that I quite literally dream about at night. And since they're so hard to find in Canada and I found one at the grocery store randomly in December, I had to get one more. Plus this thing's got like hundreds of seeds so I want hundreds of soursop plants. I removed them, got them on a piece of damp paper towel to germinate and I actually forgot about these for three months by accident. I usually check on them after about a week or two, but a few months passed and I went to check on them to see a little green tail sprouting out of the paper towel. So I opened it up and this is what we were working with. I got a tiny little pot, placed our new child right inside the new tiny home, and of course the waiting game yet again begun. You'll know if a Chirimoya or Soursop is ripe and ready to open and eat or not. I got an underripe Chirimoya to show you what not to buy. The grocery stores usually sell these slightly underripe so they don't go moldy on the shelves. So if you happen to buy a slightly underripe Chirimoya, know that it continues to ripen after being picked. So you can just leave it in your kitchen on the shelf and let it ripen at room temperature. And once it starts to give you some sensory overloads like touch, you know it's ripe. If you gently press on the skin and it gives, you know that it's ready to cut open, eat, and grow grow the seeds. But if the fruit is hard or it's difficult to press down into, the Chirimoya probably needs more time to ripen. The touch I'm talking about here, similar to a ripe avocado, it will be a little bit squishy. The smell can also help since a ripe Chirimoya and Soursop will both have sweet, fragrant aromas coming from the bottom of the fruit where it was cut from the stem end. You can also shake the fruit close to your ear and if you hear the seeds rattle inside, it likely means it's ready to cut open, the fruit is soft and you can eat it and grow it. Well, as I wait for my plants to grow, I wanted to make soursop candy. It's actually really easy to make and since the soursop is so sweet already, you just need some sugar and some boiling water and a pot. So if you'd like to make soursop candy, grab those ingredients and let's get to work. And by the way, I got a new camera that I'm really excited to try out. So this is a few minutes of me with my new camera making soursop candy and tasting the fruit of course and growing it. We're making soursop candy. I'm gonna get some sugar. 250 milliliters should be good. Mix it up. You gotta let the sugar sit with the fruit for about four hours. Let it marinate and then we're gonna boil it and wrap it up. Should I taste one? It's probably so sweet because it's already sweet without the sugar. Whoa, that's nuts. It really has the nice texture of that cacao pod. It's chewy, it's really, really good. Oh, look at this piece. Chef's kiss. I have my Chirimoya Guanabana, what's the other name again? Sour Sop with me. And now we're gonna make it into candy. Turning stove on, high heat. Then we're gonna pour candy in the pan. Then we're gonna pour it into some baggies and twist it. Let that heat up. It's just about ready to cool off. And then to get in the baggies for candy. I wanna taste it. Oh my God, this would be so good on its own as like a applesauce or something. <laughs> so good. Then you'll get your plastic baggies. You'll put your plastic pieces on a plate. Your mixture should look a little something like this. Pour some of your mixture right on top of the plastic. I didn't realize how difficult I made it for myself by cutting the baggies. So with the rest of the mixture, I just poured them straight into the baggies. I could seal them up easier that way. And that ended up looking a little something like this. So how you're gonna make your candy is your choice. Next time I'll probably try it with corn syrup instead of just sugar. But then you'll put them in the fridge and wait 24 hours until you taste it. I'm a bit scared because the color is a little bit sticky. This is what it ended up looking like. If you can see that. I think I probably should have used more sugar, but let's try it. It tastes like the same as when I tried it before I put it in the fridge. 
It's really good. Cool beans. So there you have it. Three soursops, some homemade guanabana candy, two chirimoyas, and some soursop and chirimoya plant slider. This was a wild ride, and I really hope you learned just as much as I did about these unique and tasty fruits that you should most definitely get your hands on to taste, make candy with, and of course, grow into your very own houseplant child. I killed the cat with my curiosity here on this unique fruit. I didn't realize it at first, but vanilla's got thousands of tiny seeds inside that are growable. So I got my hands on a pod to see if we could try to grow a vanilla plant. I've never opened up one of these things, so I couldn't find the seeds at first. But then I realized that the seeds are so tiny, the dark flesh inside the actual pods are the seeds. And my mind was blown. At first, I thought you could just grow the vanilla seeds on paper towel like most seeds that come from inside your fruits. I even tried it myself. But when they just molded over, I realized the problem was that the seeds are so minuscule, they're not the most suitable seeds to achieve the paper towel germination target. But I figured, if you can't grow vanilla seeds on paper towel, then how would they grow at all? And then I soon learned that with vanilla, it's a bit different. Vanilla is the fruit of white orchids, or should I say the seed pods of white orchid plants. And since the seeds are barely visible to the human eye, you need something called a culture or tissue growth medium, which is a solid, liquid, or semi-solid that supports the growth of a population of microorganisms or cells. So basically, it's just a medium that'll allow the seeds to actually grow because without it, they won't. Different types of media are used to grow different types of cells. So for plants, it's the cell culture, and for microorganisms like fungi or bacteria, it's the microbiological culture that's used. What this is actually called though, is the micropropagation of vanilla, which is basically just a gelling agent that you push the seeds into in order to grow them. So of course, I got some growth medium, and I really hope I got the right culture needed to grow our vanilla. I had no idea how to start. I don't really even know what to do, but once my culture Culture medium arrived, I was ready to start the attempt at growing the second most expensive spice in the world after saffron. I knew I needed to somehow put the liquids together and then put the seeds inside of that, and it's a good thing the culture medium came with a little instruction booklet. Bring it to a boil. Oh no. Autoclave at 121 degrees for 15 minutes, cool to 50 degrees, and portion equally into Petri dishes. So I opened up the vanilla, examined the thousands if not millions of tiny, minuscule seeds, took a minute honestly to appreciate nature and thank the universe, and then got to work. Let's get started. I scaled out 60 milliliters of distilled water and added it to 1.8 grams of agar. Measure 1.5 grams. 1.8, that's good. It smells kind of funky. Mixed it up good with a cotton swab. Cotton swabs and then headed over to the kitchen to get this boiled up. Now can I boil this? Heat in a boiling water bath. I'm scared. Pour our medium into the pot. I started to boil it and as I mixed it, mix that up, it smells so bad. I learned that with vanilla, many botanists grow it with tissue culture inside a flask with agar, but also with other specific nutrients like glucose, sucrose, carbohydrates, or other vitamins. Technically, you don't need the mixture, but it's said to help the vanilla grow pretty well. And once they do grow, then you transfer them to a new medium about every six to 12 months. And at the end of it, they should be transferred about five or six times until you can plant them in soil. So I knew that this little science plate would be the first home of many for these little seedlings. And after our mixture came to a boil, I was just about ready to add it to our little plates. I'm going to pour it in my medium. I had enough for two plates. I think I have enough for two. So I figured on one plate, we could add the seeds right on top without mixing those into the nutrient agar. And with the second plate, we could try pushing the seeds into the gel to see if that helps them grow better or even counteract any mycelium or mold that infiltrates our vanilla home since we didn't add any other vitamins into the mixture. So we're gonna let that cool off and then we are gonna put our vanilla seeds in. So let's get those ready. And in the process of micropropagation of vanilla, you're supposed to push the seeds into the gelling agent in order for them to grow so I was pretty pumped about the second plate because that's the one we pushed the seeds into and we had two experiments to see which worked better for sure for sure and yeah you guessed it this is usually done in a science lab but if you can find nutrient dense agar online you already know you do not need a lab for that we do, however, have to be really careful to work inside of a clean and sterile environment. So I'm really sorry if there are any biology majors watching this and you notice I'm not as sterile as you would be in a lab or as you would like me to be, but I definitely am trying my best. 
So if you got any vanilla micro propagation growing tips, please do not hesitate to comment below. I will take them into account, I promise. Plus, we already know it's all trial and error. So the only way that we'll know if this works or not is by doing it. Learning by doing is my favorite thing ever, evidently, based on all of the projects that we're testing in. So I got back to my little table and got ready to add our seeds into their new homes for the next little while. I've got both of my agars here. You can see them. They're now not shaking anymore. We're gonna put some seeds in here. See, whoop, whoop. one, two. Take our vanilla. I put this in the hot water so that it's sterile as possible. Get the seeds out as much as I can. Getting them all over my hands. I really hope I did this right, but I'm a first timer. Just gotta get them out like so. Probably a few hundred thousand seeds. I'm gonna leave this one as is, and then I'm gonna try and mix it into the agar in this one. The rest of these seeds I'm gonna use to make vanilla syrup. So many seeds on my fingertips. Cover those seeds in the agar. Just mix that up all in there. Get it covered in that agar, like so. And as I added our tiny seeds onto their plates. Okay, so there's one. I got pretty fascinated by vanilla in and of itself and learned that vanilla actually is not always real. What I mean by that is you may be familiar with vanillin. It's a chemical compound that basically replicates the taste of vanilla, but it's not real vanilla. It's a lab-made synthetic version of the real vanilla and it's a compound used for things like flavoring ice cream, making candies, sweetening soft drinks, baking cakes, but it isn't real. So when you're getting your vanilla flavoring, whether in the full bottle or in your coffee at the shop, make sure you know that it's that good good. Here's our second one. I'm not gonna be mixing that up at all. We're just gonna put the cover right on. And now, I guess we wait. Vanilla is my favorite plant to use as flavoring because it's in fact a plant. So the real vanilla to me is better than something like caramel that's made solely from ingredients like butter and sugar and cooking it down to make a makeshift vanilla or vanilla. I just love that vanilla is the only edible fruit of the orchid family and I'm already terrible at keeping orchids alive, but listen, if 3,000 tons of vanilla are produced every day, then that means the demand for vanilla is on the rise and we can surely grow it into a plant and maybe not mass produce it, but have homegrown vanilla seed pods that we can use for so many different things for years to come. If you control the food supply or at least your own family's food supply, then you don't need to rely on any public entity for your food and that to me is power. I also just recently found out that most grocery stores put a peel on their fruits, which is an edible outer coating to help keep the fruits shiny and make them last twice as long, which isn't normal. The company that makes it doesn't actually say what ingredients are in there. They just say it's an edible, healthy outer coating and that they use ethyl acetate and heptane as solvents, which are chemicals. So how could that be healthy? That is basically a horror story to me. And that's why I recommend that you start attempting to grow your own food at home. It doesn't just have to be fun projects like vanilla micro propagation. Grow all the vegetables you can because they can grow in like 12 weeks and fruits take longer so if you have a warm climate and the right zone, plant a lemon seed in the ground. You may have lemons in 10 years. Anywho, finally after what felt like eternity, I got the thousands of tiny seeds into their new homes. Currently, it's been about four weeks and this is what our vanilla mixtures currently look like. The one we did not mix the seeds into has unfortunately molded over, but the one that we did push the seeds into looks promising and there is no mold, so I'd say it needs a few more months to sit there and micro-propagate until we can transfer it into its next home. And since vanilla seed pods come from white orchids and white orchids are so difficult to keep alive, a lot of people actually don't know that orchids are seasonal bloomers, which means the flowers fall off in the winter but they grow back in the summer. So a lot of people think they need to throw their orchids out when the flowers fall off, but you don't. They grow back. And you may have an orchid that isn't doing well because let's be honest, we all do. So don't worry, I'm gonna show you one quick method that should really help keep your orchid alive, honestly, for 20 years or more. I call it the soaking method. This orchid I got from my communal garbage room because one of my neighbors was throwing it out, so I adopted her and saved her. And listen, we all know orchids are sensitive plants. They get dehydrated fast, they like very bright lighted environments. So depending on how far gone your little child is, 
gently unpot your orchid, rinse the roots, and prune any dead roots off. And then, depending how alive or not she is, cut off the bloom stem so that the plant doesn't divert all of its energy to flowering. And then, start the soaking method. Soak the roots in black tea for 10 minutes with filtered or bottled water. That'll be a little nutrition boost before the real soaking method. Since it won't be ready to live in water full time just yet, you'll need to introduce a system for the orchid that alternates soaking the roots in water during the day and drying the roots completely overnight to fight against root rot and continue that process for about a week. The drying periods will give your orchid a chance to acclimatize to the changes in their environment and after about a month, you should see positive growth starting again. Plus, I've also heard that if you leave your orchid living just in water rather than soil or fir bark, you could also see it do much better than it would. But personally, I have not had success with letting my orchid live in just water. It has not grown back yet that way. But the soaking method has done wonders for me. Highly recommend. So patience is key, but if you end up trying the soaking method, let me know. It worked for my orchid pretty well. But just remember, orchids are special because they produce the vanilla bean seed pods. So even though they're the most difficult thing to keep alive, don't give up on her. And now we got our seeds living in their growth mediums for the next month or so, so all we gotta do now is wait. Listen, if the first successful germination of vanilla orchid seeds in a lab was in 1922, let's see if we can be the first in 2024 to successfully germinate vanilla seeds right in our very own home. I don't know about you, but I'm excited to see if we can achieve the target. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and remember that on this channel, we take the seeds from inside exotic fruits and grow them into full-blown houseplants that fruit. And in this week's video, we attempted to take the seed pods from white orchids and micro-propagate them to see if we can grow our own full blown fruiting houseplant orchid vanilla seed pod. Most people don't even know that strawberry trees exist, and you can find them in one country in the Mediterranean, Portugal. So I went to Portugal to find the strawberry tree with my friend Haley. But to be honest, I didn't just go to Portugal to find only the strawberry tree. I also went to find the fruit that you make gin with, the fruit that you make incense with, and the tree that you make cork purses with. I found some really cool fruits in the wild. <laughs> Those are the types of seeds Try that Jessie. are edible. No. Oh. You're a wild, uh... Jesse! Wow, look at Jesse! Eat it! Good. Jesse's in her element when she gets to sniff and eat. I also ate some nice food in the city. I've never been to Portugal before, but it's the only place that still keeps the strawberry tree alive, so I was excited to venture around town to find it and taste it for the first time. Well, we started in the mountains of Sintra, and the tour guide recruited me as his plant lady. Are you surprised? Jesse. <laughs> yes, sir. What he really wanted to show me though was our first fruit tree, an olive this tree. This is an olive tree. But wild. This is an olive. It's the one that you make olive oil from. Oh, wow. But this is a wild. That means that you can do olive oil, but it takes you much more because they are not so sweet. But it's the same. It's the same hmm. tree. And what about if you eat them raw? Because I know sometimes sure. with... For example, it's like a salmon. It's a salmon salvage. Lo que hacen muchas veces. Okay. Sí. Lo que hacen muchas veces. No bueno. Bad. So awesome. Oh my god, look, dragon fruit. Dragon fruit. Oh my god. Throw with Jesse. Pat it again. Cactus pear. You can eat it. You can, you can burn the cacti off, cut it open. There's a lot of seeds, but yeah. it's really nice. Tunas. Yeah. Tunas. Yeah, yeah. Tunas. Tunas. Be careful. Claro. Be careful. I know. You know. <laughs> Be careful, Jesse. Oh. <laughs> this is what it's looking inside. Look at oh, yeah. this. Wow. It's not as ripe, but. You're a wild. Uh... Jesse! Wow, look at Jesse! Eat it. <laughs> good. Yeah? It's good, huh? Yeah. It's, good. it's nice. Anyone want some? Yeah, I want. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's really nice. Can you two see it? Yeah. Variety, different mm. cacti varieties. And just as I thought that it was getting good, it got better when our tour guide showed me a succulent called pig face that fruit. Oh, where's, yeah. Where'd you get that? <laughs> <laughs> Give me some of that. You didn't tell me this invasive plant from South, South Africa, Africa fruit. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that you were uh, an enthusiast of, because I am too. So this is the one. You take it? And those are the types of seeds Try that Jessie. are edible. No. Oh. <laughs> Better. It's like a weird version of a melon. Try it. No, you're like, no, no, thank you. Look. Yeah. Come on. Up. Yeah. There we go. Oh, wow. Right. How do you know about this? Yeah. yeah. Oh. There we go. Little seeds. Can you see them? 
Yeah. Nice. Yeah. It's go. like weird. It's kind of like melon. I don't know. It's not like the other one. It's like limey cantaloupe. Mm -hmm. This one's got the seeds. The seeds almost look like kiwi seeds. Oh, no, that's a better explanation. Kiwi? kiwi? Oh. Giving kiwi. This is true foraging in the wild. Next up, we found the incense tree, and I was pretty excited. Incense tree. You can make incense and burn oh. an incense. <laughs> Don't put it in your mouth. Sniff your fingers. Okay. <laughs> then we found black licorice, aka anise. This is anise. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Is it good? <laughs> That's a nice plan. Oh, this is great. Jessie's in her element when she gets to sniff anise and eat olives and cactus pear and this wild, weird fruit from <laughs> South Africa. <laughs> Jessie's the translator of the trip, actually. And the the Can we smell the thing again? Nice. No, smell this part. Oh. <laughs> wow. Nice. It smells like pine. It's like licorice. Do you like black licorice? No. Okay. Yeah. No. <laughs> hey! <laughs> She's being summoned. This is good to put in salads. If you take this, ah, okay. taste it. Sharp. The flavor is very good. You put it it's in like salads. It's like a little flower. It's like flower. I like it. Read it? It's, it's, it's like a little... Rice, right? It's like an edible flower. Yeah. No. Yeah. Tastes like... Lettuce? I don't know. <laughs> How do you say to linaza? Asparagus? Lino. Smell it. Fushu. Smell it. Oh. It's like sea asparagus. Now, all of this stuff was real cool, but I couldn't keep my mind off of the strawberry tree. Then I got summoned again. You cannot eat. Even the animals, they did not take this. But you can touch it? You can touch it, yeah. So don't, like don't eat this, you'll die, yeah, but I'll, I'll just touch it. Like you're you're fine. Okay. <laughs> and finally, we passed by this cork tree. It's really popular to buy these little cork items. And the tree trunk is the material from the cork tree. After nine and nine years, they make a cycle, and then you start to take the cork. Oh, wow. Oh, that's so cool. You can feel it. Yeah. It's cork. It's difficult. We would need uh, something to cut. Wow. Can anybody just go and take it from the tree or is there regulations? Yeah, this is just the skin. They were existing from here to Greece. But finally, I think we were about to come up on our strawberry tree because he said... And you asked for a aguardente de Finally, I was standing right in front of a strawberry tree, otherwise known as madronio. Looks like a lychee. Yeah, it's very, very sweet. Apparently it tastes like a peach and a mango, and it's even used to make alcohol. But for some reason, this fruit's losing its popularity around the Mediterranean, and Portugal is one of the only countries making an effort to keep the strawberry tree alive. But what does it taste like? Ooh. We were about to find out. The Medronio tree! Oh, is it tart? Oh. You need to try it. Okay. Tart. Yeah. <laughs> it was so tart like a cherry. It didn't really taste like a strawberry, but I think it was so worth it to finally find the strawberry tree. I also learned that they use bamboo as barriers in communities, which was really cool too. You see the barriers that they would use to make for the agriculture. You see the bamboos? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And finally, we stumbled upon the fruit that you make gin with. You will recognize the smell of the, the, the gin. See. Smell it? Oh yeah. Smell the gin? Mm-hmm. Do. These are juniper berries, and as the flavors of different plants and herbs were explored back in the day, the unique taste of juniper berries was discovered, probably through trial and Google. <coughs> but then they developed distillation techniques, refined it, concentrated the flavors, and evolved it into gin. And as cool as foraging was, there was more to do, so off we went to the next stop. It was time to eat. We bought all the ingredients from the grocery store and here. Cheers. <laughs> made these sandwiches ourselves and oh my god. Oh goodness. Mm -hmm. 10 out of 10. Cheers. Then I tried a crab croquet. Is it good? Oh, interesting. It's like, um... Then we needed some sangria and pastel de natas, the famous pastry of Portugal. So off we went to the market. Okay. Now for the real stuff. Ellie, why would I be? Ellie, okay. I want 
that's Portuguese tart number one. Okay. And as the night came to a close, we went for exotic seafood, okay? If you've never tried razor clams, 10 out of 10, highly recommend. They're so good. Then I ordered the biggest seafood plate they had on the menu and made Haley try it all for the first time. She's never had seafood. <laughs> I like, like a famous. Okay, ready? Ready. Let's go. Oh, baby. There we go. <laughs> no. Oh, no. <laughs> That was, that was my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I spritzed on that. Cheers. Also, it was my birthday. Happy birthday to this <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Had a little snack the next morning. And for brunch, oh my god, you guys. Oh, wow. Artichoke is one of my favorite foods in the world. You know how long it takes to get that out of the unbloomed flower? You know artichokes are unbloomed flowers? Are they, they roasted? They them right before they bloom into a flower, so it's like a rose before it opens up. And then they cook them and eat them. But if they were to leave them on the plant, they open up into a big blue flower. Oh, and I, I don't know if we can eat them after that. Okay, I'm doing like a individual bite right now. Cheers. <laughs> oh my god. Really good. Some olive oil. So rich. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Like that was like a ten. flavor like a roller coaster right there. Right. First I tasted the salt, then mm -hmm. I tasted the olive oil, then I tasted the creaminess of the cheese, and then the artichoke. I'm like, <laughs> Exactly. Jessie's feeling a little ill. She's working on those oregano pills. My throat hurts. I don't know why. Very nice. And Portugal isn't complete without sardines, so I took Haley for her first sardines. Haley's about to try this. I have descaled it for her. And this is what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> and as our trip came to a close, Woo! the only thing last left that we had to do was try all the exotic fruits that we didn't find in the mountains. Oh baby. Hello. We have fresh fat figs. Oh. How are you oh, eating it? My God. I'm just gonna go for it. Oh, you do that side too? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Not as the sweetest one I have had, but fresh. Wanna try a piece of lemon and see if it's riper? It's good. Yeah, maybe a little bit. Do you want me to finish it? Yeah. Seven point five? Yeah, it's like agreed. It's nice. I think these figs were seven point five. I once tried to germinate fig seeds and I left them in the paper towel for a full year. Mm. Just hoping for the best and a year later they grew. Mm. Mangosteen. The best fruit ever. If you like these, I'll be so happy. But if you don't, it's okay too. You usually take the top part off. Then you kind of just don't do it too hard because you don't want to squish the fruit. Oh shit. What the f oh. Oh. I know. I don't know uh, what's going on here. Should I just bite it? Oh, it's bitter. <laughs> okay, let's, let's just, just try yours for now. Bigger ones, like that has a seed, I have the one below it. Mmm. I've never tasted that. Right and texture. Mm. So good. So interesting. I'm gonna like bite around this thing. I'll save them for later. Really? To grab. Okay. <laughs> I'm really interested to see if you like tamarind. I know I like the paste. Is it a lot more? Uh, honestly, I would say so. The most natural one there is. Tamarind is next up. 
I can eat this whole thing. Yeah, but they have seeds in the middle, so, so don't eat that. So don't eat the seed. Mm. You're like a cherry. Mm. How good. Mm -hmm. Does it taste like the sauce? Kind of. Save those seeds. Save the seeds. <laughs> she thinks I'm kidding, but I'm not. You like this? Mm -hmm. So nice. Last but not least, finger limes. Da 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 finger limes. Which one should I do? I don't know. Which one speaks to you? Oh, you wanted it. No, 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 no. I'm like, yeah, eat it. I don't know how to open it because usually you like cut it in half, but smelly. Oh. Do you hear oh, it inside? That smells, good. that smells really good. Oh. It's probably going to be bitter, but I think I'm just going to bite it a bit. But don't eat the skin. Oh, it's it. pink inside! Oh, cute! Do Look at like, this! Do you like sideways or do you like the same way? Yeah, just use your teeth and like one, one and done. It's better, it's better. <laughs> it's bad! It's bad. Oh yeah, it's like caviar. Pink. Pretty! <gasps> Save those seeds, please! Cheers. Cheers. Sour. Yeah, sour. <laughs> I like the texture of them. That's fun. How cute would these be on salad or crackers or cheese? Or just on a cheese board. Just play it. Cute. You can't really find these in Canada. And i never seen them this fat. Oh yeah? Mm -hmm. I love the sound it makes. I think your way was the way to do it. These are popping like my ears are popping. I'm a little sick. Oh, you're a poppin' around now like no one's business. <laughs> Alright, thanks for coming to our fruit talk. I found this caterpillar and wanted to see if I could hatch it. I took the dark, spiky bug and put her in my little animal kingdom, added some oats, some apple, a piece of egg carton. I was determined to be a very good caterpillar mother. And I waited. But when I checked on it the very next day, there was no caterpillar in this enclosure. I thought she had escaped, but upon a closer look, I saw what looked to be her spiky skin on the floor, and I realized that she must have already gone through part of her metamorphosis and cocooned. So I set up my time lapse and waited for 15 days. But after five days, I noticed she wasn't moving at all in the cocoon. As days turned to weeks, I was getting nervous I did something wrong and she wouldn't hatch at all. Those two weeks felt like a whole lifetime, but on day 16, I noticed the cocoon looked really dark with a purple glowing shade. It was like she was glowing. So I sat there for a few hours and then like a miracle, she delicately emerged from her cocoon. I watched as our dark little spiky caterpillar transformed into a breathtaking, vibrant, colorful butterfly. I witnessed an incredible metamorphosis. I set up three cameras and got three different views of the metamorphosis. It was awesome. After she hatched, of course, I documented every moment. I had never in my life held a butterfly before and I learned that in order for a butterfly to actually fly after hatching, the process of it spreading its wings after hatching is a crucial step. Basically their wings are small, folded, and very wet when they hatch and they're crumbled, tightly packed against their body and the wetness is what helps pump fluid out to stretch and harden the wings and allow them to grow properly so they can fly. So you gotta give the butterfly something to hold on to that can allow her wings to slowly dry and expand and that takes about four hours. You can imagine how nervous I was that I would do something wrong and be the cause of her wings not spreading out, but I was patient and I watched as I let nature do its thing. I sat there for five hours, but the time was right. I poked my little finger in her enclosure, which was my attempt in giving her a little hand in flying and use it as an excuse to become friends with my first ever butterfly. Finally, she delicately crawled onto my finger and latched onto my nail and she even made her first few attempts to flap and I was really excited. 
I sat there as I watched her begin to fine tune her flight capabilities and maximize her aerodynamic efficiency. I learned that she's a morning cloak butterfly. They're found in North and South America, Europe and Asia, and they can live up to 11 months, which is nine months longer than the regular lifespan of other butterflies. Some only live for a few days while others can survive for a few months. She's so small and pretty. You can find them in wooded areas, parks, gardens, just in case you decide to go on a caterpillar hunt after watching this video. She was surprisingly playful as she began to learn to flap her wings so she could fly away alongside nature. I was in awe. Even Raffi really loved her. He was so delicate with her and gave a nice little yawn after sniffing her. And I got my macro camera out and started filming her body close up because I never saw something as beautiful in my life that I felt like I helped bring into this world because although butterflies of course can hatch in nature, you never know if a critter or an enemy will come and eat the cocoon or if the cocoon will get lost or fall. So I think I gave it the optimal chance at life. But slowly but surely, her wings began to flap more and it seemed like she was getting ready to fly. She attempted to fly indoors a bit and landed on the windowsill. But once a butterfly is ready for flight, they'll excrete a couple drops of water from the tips of their wings before they take flight and that's how you know they're ready to fly. This process is called gotation. And at first, I thought this butterfly had peed on me. Oh, she just peed on me. But then I learned about this amazing phenomenon called gotation. So I knew she was ready for flight. I wanted to keep her forever, but I hoped she would be my garden butterfly and remember me. Can we take her out to the garden? Ready for flight. I took her out to the garden to prepare her so she could practice some more. We're gonna hope that she stays in the garden box to live there. But she didn't want to fly away. She liked me. After about 30 minutes, she still didn't want to fly away. You know what? I know it's a scary world out there. Maybe she's not ready yet. So I took her back inside. Maybe she'll be my garden butterfly. She's gonna flap him again. <laughs> I left the door open just in case she changed her mind it was a little rainy out. Plus, I was fully open to the idea of having her live with me and becoming Rafi's little sister. But I knew that I couldn't stop her from living freely in nature and getting all the pollen in the world from the most beautiful flowers. What I knew was coming all along, the moment I dreaded but also kind of longed for. She decided to fly outside and I sprinted after her to see where she went, but she took a moment as if she was saying thank you and goodbye, and she flew away gracefully in the warm summer air. I was really sad. <laughs> <laughs> I named her Sunny, inspired by her name Morning Cloak. She flew away. No, my baby. <laughs> I felt an instant connection with Sunny. I marveled at her graceful flights and the way she delicately explored her surroundings, so I was really sad, but determined to keep helping caterpillars and their journey of metamorphosis into the next stages of life. I'm mourning the loss of our morning cloak. I hope she looks good. She was nervous. I knew her story deserved to be shared with the world and I just know she's going to be the most famous butterfly in the world. But really, the life cycle of butterflies, particularly the process of metamorphosis, is a remarkable and awe-inspiring transformation that I honestly feel lucky I was able to witness. To me, it serves as a powerful reminder of the cyclical nature of life, growth, change, and the deeper appreciation for the interconnectedness and resilience of nature. It's incredible how something so small can bring so much joy. I really hope she comes to visit me, but now you already know that I'm gonna go on another caterpillar hunt to find a second one and grow it into a butterfly. So come back to see our next butterfly hatch. I really hope that you enjoyed this process just as much as me. You never guess it, but tucked under a foot of snow in this Canadian forest is a giant maple syrup farm. And I wanted to know how frozen maple syrup taffy is made, so I came to the sugar bush to find out. You might wonder why I didn't just go to the store to buy the syrup and scoop some snow off the ground to make the taffy. But it's because here, the art of sugaring is more like a science. People look at maple syrup and think corn syrup or table syrup is from the tree, but that's not what maple syrup is. You can't create it in a lab because it has to come from the tree itself. And in the world of sugaring, it all starts with these sugar maple trees. 
But how do you go from the tree to syrup on a mass scale? Well, we headed into the sugar bush to find out. I'm here with my girl, Michelle. We are gonna go on a maple syrup tour where we're gonna taste taffy and roll it in the snow and learn how it's made. We're gonna extract it from the tree. Come along with us. We're gonna show you exactly how Canadians make maple syrup straight from the maple trees. Come along! <laughs> right, so where's that little farmhouse thing? I think it's here. Right here. Let's hope it's here. And our maple experience began with a pancake, bacon, sausage, and hot chocolate breakfast inside of this beautiful horse barn canteen. We're Let's going to eat some pancakes. And bacon. And sausage. And maple syrup. Mmm. Mm. Hey guys. Hi. Hi. Could you? Can you get some pancakes? Yeah. yeah. Oh my god, stop. They have like tables everywhere. This is so cute. This it's is like a little adorable. restaurant. This is where you come for breakfast? Wow. wow. I love this. Awesome. Aww. This is Rafi. Yeah, for the Christmas tree. Yeah? Thanks for having us back. As we enjoyed our breakfast, we learned that in the language of Canadian, it's said that when you tap your first maple tree, it's the greatest feeling in the world. And naturally, I wanted to know what that felt like. So I was excited. Cheers. Yes. Let's see how much he pours on his. <laughs> I'm gonna just go. It's from the tree. <laughs> Yeah. And after breakfast, we made our way down the snowy, wintry sugar bush trail. You can Mike, go get a toboggan. Not without a toboggan, though. Raffi, come. Raffi, go in there. Are going to carry this the whole time? Yeah, just drag it. It's part of the experience. Michelle, you don't want to ride? Sure. Michelle, get on the toboggan. And it was about a two kilometer hike in the snow. <laughs> <laughs> My butt is wet. Raff wants to get on there with you. Until we arrived to the sugar bush shack where they make their maple syrup. <laughs> sugar bush. You want to come? Now we're on our way to the sugar bush. So come along with us, right, Michelle? Yeah, what she said. <laughs> sugar bush. Sugar bush. Sugar bush. Sugar bush. Run, Mikey, run. <laughs> Are you worried we're not gonna get this? Yeah, we're gonna get lost. Are we lost? I think so. In the forest. <laughs> Come back on it. We're going downhill now. But it's so wet. Along the trail, we learned that starting in December each year, crews spend two months putting plastic taps into each tree by hand. And the same tree can be tapped for decades, but only if you tap eight inches because you never want to harm a tree. This way, it can heal properly and be ready for the next season's maple sap tapping. The maple syrup season usually starts in February and runs through April, but it all really depends on the weather because when the temperature is above freezing during the day and below freezing at night, that's about when Mother Nature gifts us with her sap. Usually, it's extracted through tubing or through gravity and carried to the evaporator and boiler station. And once the water is collected, you need to boil it down so that you get rid of the 98% of the water until you're left with the 2% sugar, and then you need to boil it until it goes from 2% sugar to around 67% sugar. Of course, the longer you boil it, the thicker it becomes, and then you can make maple syrup taffy over ice. So, the water is pulled out of the sap, and the sap is boiled into maple syrup, and it actually takes about 44 gallons of sap to make just one gallon of maple syrup. Crazy. But after a short hike in the cold Arctic, we finally arrived to the sugar shack. We made it to the, the sugar, sugar bush. bush. <laughs> Let's go in and learn about some maple syrup. We checked the sap buckets, we tasted raw sap, partially cooked sap, and maple sugar, and we made maple toffee over snow. Oh my god, this is where they put all the sap. <gasps> oh, look at that. Wait, never mind, maybe. No, no, you're right. Look, and they... Yeah, but look inside, there's snow in here. Unless it's just frozen, I don't know what that frozen. is. Maybe they'll show us inside. Ooh. Hello. Hello. How are you? Good, thank you. Ooh, la, try some of the sap right from the tree. Not that one. Not that this one. one. <laughs> this is sap right from the tree. Yes, sir. And Cheers. Cheers. Wait, Cook. can we come and drink it with oh, you? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Cheers. Wow. Mmm. <laughs> This is very nice and sugary. That's about three percent. This one here is partially cooked for maybe no, 16, 17 hours. So try that. Yeah, we can try it. Oh, this is very, very awesome. Yes. Ready? Cheers. Cheers. 
Whoa. Whoa. Mm. That's Whoa. insane. So this one's been cooked? Yes, partially cooked for 16 hours. But it's not complete maple syrup oh, no, though, right? No, 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 long ways. And this one's the sugar right from the Whoa. tree. Try it out. So cool. Wow. Can we try that too? Yes. And then oh, I've got this? maple toffee here too. Wow. Oh. Maple sugar. I'll take a nice fat piece. <laughs> Come and see it. Mm. <laughs> That's good. Nice. Mm. Whoa. That's so yummy. I don't know if I'd ever be able to work at a maple strip farm because then I would just eat it. Eat all. everything. Eat everything. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Thank you so much. Oh, you're right. I'm going to make some toffee here. All right. And there's the toffee here. Oh, this is the part that we were excited for. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> maple toffee, the part that I was most excited for since the last time I did that was when I was a kid, and now I'm not sure why I waited so long to do it again since I am Canadian. Oh, that's a big one. We'll show you. <laughs> this is how you make like the toffee. Wow. Oh, so cool. So what you want to do is take the stick, the stick in. Nice. Oh, this is going to be oh, big. Oh, 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 oh. Here, somebody wants a big one. Try that. Me. Mm. Okay. Oh, that looks oh, great. That's nice. Oh. Mm. oh, it's getting hard already. Oh, yeah, we got yours. Makes the an no, of course, that's kids come first. That makes the anticipation wow. that much more. Oh. Mm. Thank you. All right, ready? This is what it looks like. Ready? Mm. <laughs> it tastes like free, you know that trend where you freeze honey? Is that what it, it tastes like? It tastes like that, but way better. Mm. Maybe I'll get a second. Can I bother you for one more? Do it. Is that the same maple syrup that you That's you, maple that, syrup, that it's sell? only cooked it, down more, yes. Wow. There are four grades of maple syrup, golden, amber, dark, and very dark. The taste descriptors go from light syrup to dark syrup, and what I love about this farm is that their syrup, they make it exactly how the settlers did 200 years ago. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. Raw. Too good this to say no. Is partially, partially cooked, mm. and then I added their sugar. So wow. I'm gonna do it in the right Look at that pull. They use stainless steel equipment rather than cast iron pots, and they cook the syrup real naturally to get the proper caramelization, only extracting what the tree is actually capable of providing without disturbing nature and ensuring they can reuse the tree for the next years to come and allow them to heal fully. But what big producers do, which I found alarming, is attach a vacuum to way too many trees connected all together, forcing the trees to pull more sap than they're capable of providing using a pipeline. And we all know that when you tug on nature, you affect a whole bunch of it. So in my opinion, these large producers are affecting the longevity of the trees by not allowing them to heal properly and extracting more than the trees are willing to give to us. And then the big producers only take about 60% of the water out of the sap using reverse osmosis, rather than the 90% here without using the reverse osmosis. I want to go in there. And we all know that when you take a shortcut, especially in cooking or baking, it just won't taste as good. Is there anyone in there? No. That strong maple taste only really comes from that long-term natural cooking and as time consuming as it is, it's near impossible for large producers to be able to get the same results as smaller producers, especially without harming the trees. What's going on back here? Nothing, absolutely nothing. If you come around to the window anymore. <laughs> Oh. Not at all. Oh, is this Derek? No, this is not Derek. Oh. I don't know who this nice gentleman is. I'm Fred. I'm Derek. You're Fred? Dad. Oh, you're wow. Derek's dad! <laughs> so you tell him when you go back there that you met me and you thought it was his brother, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> mm, smells good. So what happens in here? Is this the sap from the tree? So this is what we call the evaporator. So this cooks about 85% of the water, and as it increases in its density here, it flows through this pipe into what's called the finishing pan. Now the finishing pan doesn't really make finished maple syrup, but it gets it real close. And to get it real close is quite a technique. If you guys are going to be in here in half an hour, you'll hear a lot about it underneath oh, that tree it. there with the flag. Right. Where are you guys from? Just the city, Toronto. Yeah, I'm from Toronto. <laughs> oh, yeah, you know what? Down the road, yeah. I get nervous when I'm sure the highway is Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Fred. So Thank lot. you. If you can get the temperature right, then you can make maple syrup that lasts for more than a hundred years. Michelle, what did he say? As soon as he rings the bell, there's a presentation at the big tree. Thank you.
To make perfect maple syrup, you cook at 7.5 degrees above the boiling point of water. What are the chances I can do the pour? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice and slow. Nice and slow? Yeah. It's pretty liquidy. Okay. It's slow like oil. Okay, ready? <laughs> like oil. Oh, oh. You're right, goes. Nice. No, it's not slow. <laughs> Thank you. And then I just turn it. Yeah, stick it right in the middle. Oh, oh. right in the middle. <laughs> 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 this is why you get No, but it turned out so you. good. Look at it. You did a good job. Nice. I'm just going to pop the whole thing. Yeah. There you go. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. Nice. It's like smoky. So good. Yeah. Thank you for letting me do that. <laughs> I'll, I'll take it if you don't mind. Mike would take the whole bottle. <laughs> Get some packing snow, bring it home. Tell some friends we're having some booth and bottles tonight of yeah, maple, maple syrup. syrup. <laughs> if you've ever bought maple syrup and it's crystallized over time on the sides or on the lid, or it's even gone moldy, there's a reason for that. And that's the wrong temperatures being utilized during production, or just not enough percentage of actual maple sap and syrup to keep it clean. Because you shouldn't get any crystallization or mold if it's clean, good, natural maple syrup. We also learned how maple syrup was even discovered, and I was shook. Canada is cold, and when the European settlers first arrived here, probably at this very tree 300 years ago, they had no access to fruit or berries because of the cold, so all they were really eating was meat, like beaver, elk, deer, moose, bear, all the Canadian animals. But part of the reason why these groups survived next to eating the meat in the winter was because of the maple sap they drank and the sugar and the syrup that they learned how to make. Word spread around the block, and after a while, everyone in town was sharing maple syrup together to survive, even if they were from different settler groups. Legend has it that it was first noticed by indigenous hunters after a droplet fell from a broken maple tree branch onto someone's hand after an ice storm and they did what anyone would do. They licked it, and at first they thought it was water, but then they realized they were tasting something sweet. And then they looked up and noticed sweet sap droplets falling everywhere and realized that couldn't be water. But how they turned that water into sugar was another tale. Legend has it that every tree inhales carbon dioxide and turns that into oxygen, but this tree does something a little different. It inhales CO2 and turns it into oxygen and starch, and the photosynthesis with the sun on the leaves is what turns that starch into sugar. And when the fall comes, the sugar goes down the tree trunk and deep down into the roots in the ground, and then it comes back up in the spring as maple sugar. So to actually collect the sap, birch bark baskets were used to collect it. Of course, after taking a hatchet and opening a huge wound on the tree big enough to let more than 60 droplets fall per minute, the sap water would drip off the bark and into the buckets, and once they had enough sap water, they would pour it into a hollowed out log with stones, and then put that over a fire and start rolling the stones in the log on the fire until the maple sap turned thicker and thicker and suddenly became maple syrup and then further crystallized into maple sugar. The benefit was that you could store the syrup and sugar in these birch bark containers and it would literally never go bad. So whenever people needed nourishment in the freezing outdoor temperatures, they would come to the birch bark container for a boost, especially since they later realized that maple, maple syrup is 42 minerals and vitamins and 10 antioxidants. Well, we were so excited by all of this information, but the problem was we were so cold, so it was hard to imagine ourselves as settlers back in the day in this weather without a warm home to go inside of, but it's a good thing there was a little cute campfire. We couldn't feel our noses and toes. The little fire pit. They're so cold. The feet. Yeah. Michelle, he's cold. Yeah. It's actually smart. Michelle. So nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. My name is also Michelle. Oh, oh really? That's, That's so funny. <laughs> I promise I didn't know your name. Well, I call this order. Michelle McSmalley. <laughs> so. so with that, we started to make our way from the Sugar Shack to the Maple Syrup Museum of Ontario in Heritage Barn, where we got to taste the amber and the dark maple syrups, as well as so many other cool maple products. I want to try the dark one now. Canada has historically dominated the maple syrup market with 90% of the world's maple syrup coming from Canada's sugar maple tree. That's quite good. <laughs> The maple leaf you know on the Toronto Maple Leafs hockey team? Yeah, that's the leaf from the maple tree that you extract maple sap from to turn into syrup. This is the dark one. That's whoa. Whoa. Mm, that is so that is like good. This one's lighter. Should we try this one too? Mm -hmm. Stop. 
thoughts. I like the dark. It has more of an aftertaste of maple. I know. That's true. Like I agree dark? with that. One more. <laughs> so good. That's the one. We were lucky that we got to see Derek, the owner in the museum. Hi, Derek. Oh, I emailed we you. We emailed back and forth. Do you want a hug? Yes, of course. I'm the cameraman last time. This You're is my not? brother, Mike. Hey, Mike, how are you? Nice to meet you. Do you want a hug? So she showed up at Christmas, and I had literally 10 seconds. Like, it was so <laughs> Yeah, it was so here. busy. So today's the first day we're open for our maple experience. Oh, we oh, did no. the whole experience with the pancakes and the sausages, and we went and flipped the maple syrup in the ice. And and so and we are aiming to provide authentic experience for the people of Toronto to get out of the city for a, a few hours. Bring your dog. The dog oh, can go yeah. anywhere. Good having you here. Yes. Double hug. Double hug. Lucky me. Double now hug. we got to buy some maple syrup. You guys remember Fred? I'm his brother. Help us. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big <laughs> I'm glad he's looking this good. Hopefully I look that good at 81. That's right. 81. That's a wow. blessing. Hey, so you watch YouTube, right? That's all I watch. <laughs> she's a YouTuber. Yeah. Have you been a CP20? Have you been on her YouTube channel? No, she's here filming for her even, YouTube channel. You are? I love it, I love it, I love it. Yes. Right. Yes. That's why we had so many questions for you. Exactly. Awesome, way to go. <laughs> so you have, wow, this is so exciting. <laughs> Since I discovered YouTube, I don't watch television anymore. Yeah. Quite the literally, same as my me dad. too. Thank exactly. you so much for yeah, having me. Really oh, good having you. Come on back. Come sure. on back. You want to do maple syrup again? Come on back in April when it's nice uh, and yeah. warm. That'd be awesome. Yeah. yeah. Bring a bus load. <laughs> <laughs> What a great guy, what an amazing family. So we may come back in April to do another private tour and maybe bring some of you guys along with us on a big bus, so stay tuned for that. But that is the insane process of how one tree can produce gallons and gallons of maple syrup that tells a tale 100% worth learning about. I told you you'd never guess it, but tucked away in the snowy Canadian forests holds millions of maple trees that have created what we know and love today as frozen maple toffee. And maple syrup, of course. Now you know why I didn't just go to the store to buy some syrup to pour on the snow, because the art of sugaring truly is like a science. And y'all know we're the queens of science. Anywho. So that was the tour. I hope you guys liked it. We're gonna buy some maple syrup now and go warm up because it's pretty yeah. I found this ladybug baby while I was out for a walk and I saw that she just had babies, so I thought I'd give them a little help and hatch them. Watching their metamorphosis was insane, so I wanted to share their life cycle with you. At first, I went on a hunt to try and hatch a butterfly, and while I was out, I found these little ladybug larvae. So I took the little larvae and put them in my insect bug box. I'm not sure how old these larvae were, but before they become these little reptiles, it all starts with a tiny oval-shaped egg that the ladybug lays on a plant leaf. She carefully chooses a safe spot so her babies will have a good chance to grow up healthy. And in just two to three days, the eggs hatch and out comes the ladybug larva. At this stage, the larva looks nothing like the colorful round ladybugs that we all know. Instead, it resembles a tiny alligator with a long body, six spiky legs, and black and yellow stripes. It's the bright colors that serve as a warning to predators that they taste bad and might be poisonous. Don't worry though, this little larva is a voracious eater. It loves to feast on tiny pests like aphids and mealybugs, helping to keep our gardens healthy. I was quite surprised at how different the little alligator-like larva look from the adult ladybugs. At first I didn't even know that this was a ladybug, but I now had two ladybugs in my little bug box ready to morph into the next stages of life. They usually stay little alligators for three to four weeks, enough time to do some serious chowing down, but cannibalism is a very real threat for growing ladybug babies. They often eat each other, so they've got to be careful. But during the larval stage, the ladybugs look for a safe place to morph into their next stage of life that of the pupa. This is the magical stage. They attach themselves belly first to a surface like a leaf or a stem. In this case, the larva attached its belly to the side of the bug enclosure, and it was pretty cool how it just stuck there and never fell off. They must excrete some sort of sticky substance that helped them to stick. During this time, they do not eat, 
and like a butterfly, they are hidden inside of their pupa morphing into the next stages. The ladybug will bounce and wiggle in an upwards and downwards motion as it sheds its skin, and some of the larval skin will hang around a bit, which is normal. It will shed its skin up to four times to reveal a new, larger body underneath. The future beetle, yes ladybugs are beetles, scrunches up to be more compact and begins to look less like an alligator and more like a ladybug. The pupa will change in color, going from dark to pastel orange. This process lasts about a week or so, ending when the little one makes its way out of the pupal skin. It's a bit like a butterfly cocoon. Inside this pupa, incredible changes are happening. Once the orange oval-shaped ladybug emerges from the pupa, the new adult is soft-winged and lighter in color than it will be in the future. It takes a couple of days for those vibrant wing covers to take their final harder form, just like a butterfly needs time to develop their wings to fly after hatching. The black dots on the wing covers will also emerge after about four hours. They'll begin to darken and become more visible after the exoskeleton hardens and the red colors on the bug mature. Now each ladybug have distinct patterns and a distinct number of spots on their wing covers. The most common species of ladybug, the seven spotted ladybug, typically has seven black spots on its red wing covers, but there are also other species with different spot patterns ranging from two to 24 spots. But another physical change is that the ladybug leaves behind a yellow liquid before it's ready to fly. And what looks like pee is actually just blood that the ladybug secretes from its leg joints to tell you and other predators to back off. This liquid actually contains chemicals that deter predators from trying to eat them. It's a form of chemical defense known as reflex bleeding. It's their natural defense mechanism that helps keep them safe. But once the exoskeleton is hard, the ladybug can fly, displaying its new, usually red and black, wings for the world. And when ladybugs take flight, they fold their developed wings, located beneath the colorful wing covers, and they can fly at speeds of up to 15 miles per hour. It was so beautiful watching the little wings emerge. I was so upset, but I was hoping that she would come and visit me in my garden and eat all the aphids. But then comes the feasting. Ladybugs are the most natural form of controlling pests because they're voracious predators of plant-eating pests like aphids, mites, mealybugs, insect eggs. They also do eat pollen, but they also eat each other. A single ladybug can consume up to 5,000 aphids in its lifetime, so they really help protect crops in the garden, and they really do play an important role in maintaining ecological balance. And remember, they can only live for up to one year, so that's a lot of of aphids. Their lifespan is a lot longer than other insects, some noted to even live for two years. But once they eat, they can find a lover and make more babies. And then the cycle starts all over again with some little eggs on a tiny leaf or in a bug box if you're like me. What I find really cool about ladybugs is that they can be found on every single continent except for Antarctica. So they're highly adaptable. They've adapted to various climates and habitats around the world. I'm from Canada and clearly they can survive in very harsh Canadian winters. And the way that they survive in winters like in Canada is by hibernating and gathering together in large groups, often in crevasses or under leaves to conserve energy and to stay warm. I'm sure you can agree with me that the process of hatching a ladybug is a fascinating journey to observe from egg to ladybug. It's one of the many wonders of nature, so getting to watch the metamorphosis firsthand felt like a privilege. And the best part was that it only took 10 days. We're lucky to have these lovely helpers in our gardens, I honestly believe that, but that's the story of Lady. I hope you'll find little alligators and keep them and grow them into ladybugs, but if you don't, I hope you enjoyed watching Lady grow and develop. When you guys asked me to dive into the world of mango cultivation, I couldn't resist. Your request set me on a path I never expected because I've spent the last three years dedicating myself to mastering the art of growing mangoes and the results have been incredible. Well, I'm here to show you the insane journey, so buckle up because it's gonna be a wild ride. You all know I couldn't resist a mango challenge. Well, first things first, I got my hands on a mango. I ripped open the husk to reveal the inner seed, peeled it right out. It did help to cut a piece of the husk 
mask off before ripping it open, which you can do too if you're trying this at home. But then I wrapped it in a piece of saran wrap. Here is where you want to keep your saran wrap not sopping wet, but pretty damp so that it has the right environment to grow. So spritzing it every three days is great so it stays hydrated. And then you wait for your little tail to sprout. After about just one week, the seed started to turn green and a tiny tail started to pop out of the little bum. Now I'm from Canada as most of you know, so the growth is automatically a little slower here because it's not as hardy oh, of a zone. But it started to grow nicely. It was, however, turning a little bit black, so just in case we failed, I got two mangoes. Because we in fact try many ways of growing on this channel. And if you don't already know, nine times out of ten, I, I fail. But then, I just try again and I learn from the first fail so that the second time I try, it usually works out. Well, that's the case with mango number two. I gave it a little bath and a little jade roll. Really had to optimize the chances of really the seed sprouting here. And then I sprung the husk open to reveal and remove the inner seed. From there, I peeled that outer layer of skin off of the mango seed, placed it in saran wrap, and you already know, waited for growth. This growth time lapse is about nine months long. It even started to look like a baby dragon of some sort, and I was quite excited for birthing this wild mango lady. Well, yeah. I decided to leave them germinating in their saran wrap homes, and in the meantime, while we waited for our mango dragon trees to grow into this beautiful tree, I decided that it was time for a family of mango trees. So you already know what I had to do. I got my hands on a third mango. This time, a baby Atolfo variety. And I got to work to sprout a baby tree. By this point, I feel like I was starting to get a mango obsession and anytime I got a mango, I didn't want to throw the seed out so I was looking very forward to a whole party of seeds germinating. Not germinate, but germinate. But I wanted to try all the different varieties of mangoes and most importantly all the different ways of growing them to see which one yielded the best and most fast results too. So I ripped open the husk to reveal that inner seed and a small piece broke off. But I still had faith in this mango and it was going to be a good experiment to see if you could grow a seed that had a broken piece. Place it in a piece of saran wrap dripped some water on it to keep it damp, spritzed it every three days religiously three until the baby sprout started to form. It was such a unique and beautiful process watching the little roots on this baby mango seed grow. It kind of reminded me how we as humans are capable of such growth too. It's just that sometimes we don't see it because things happen so fast before our eyes, but when you look back, you see all the progress and growth that really was made, even if some pieces fall off along the way. Humans are basically just houseplants with more complicated emotions, so make sure to water yourself and douse yourself in sun. But anywho. Once it grew big enough to plant in soil, I got a little pot and I placed it right in. But here is where I wasn't sure if I needed to plant the seed all the way under the soil or lay it on top of the soil so I was nervous it wouldn't grow much since this was the first mango I ever planted in soil. And my success rates with soil are not the most hardy. At this point I was wondering, well we're on mango number three and doing pretty well so do we call it luck or the fact that we've been working really hard to make these things sprout? I say the latter. Or maybe not because after a few more weeks that baby mango unfortunately died. I'm very very sorry. I was a bit upset but very determined. So I figured okay let's try one more time with mango number four. I wanted to see if leaving it to grow in the saran wrap for a little bit longer was a good idea or not. So naturally, I cut it all up to eat it. But then the middle husk was left to rip open and obtain the prize inside. Honestly, the waiting game is the hardest part here, but it does take time and patience to see any growth. Well, I added it back with the rest of my germinating seeds. And although you can keep it in a dark place in your kitchen, I actually prefer to keep the germinating seeds taped on the window where a lot of sun comes. I find that it grows faster and nicer. Controversial to what other botanists may think because some of them germinate them in the dark. But you can try whichever way your little heart is at. And after just one week, the seed started to turn green and at that point I knew it was a very good sign as more growth would start shooting out within the next week. Well, weeks passed. This one was growing a little bit. Not a lot. So I figured, well, since the seed is green, let's try planting it in soil and see if it can grow better in there. I decided to leave a little bit of the seed exposed to the air just in case. To help it grow a little bit better. So far, it seemed like it was working and as I was waiting, of course, I got a little impatient. I'm sorry, okay? I'm a little bit of a crazy plan lady I wanted a mango tree but I also got a little bit obsessed here and I was excited to get my hands on mango number five this time I wanted to see if the seed would germinate in water rather than keeping it in the saran wrap kind of like I do with my avocados but I broke the seed and if you're growing mangoes at home be very careful when you rip the husk open to remove that seed especially if you're doing it with a utensil like a knife because you don't want to be too rough with it like me or else you have a high chance of breaking the seed however I still did want to see if it would grow so I pieced it back together with a toothpick and I figured Maybe it's perfect since we needed to insert the toothpicks anyway to have it submerge in the water properly. But I was also quite upset because it didn't grow. I'm sorry, okay? It just turned 
black and mold it over. Sketch mycelium. Don't worry, it's just a little bit of mold. It won't hurt you, okay? But I feel like you already know what I had to do. I was so determined and I persevered. I went back to the grocery store and I got mangoes that I promised myself I would be more gentle with. Because hey, what's four more mangoes in the grand scheme of our mango family? It's like when you're having a baby, but then you have twins. Yeah, exactly. Like It's just fate, okay? Sometimes you can't help it. So now, I was on mangoes number six, seven, eight, and nine. I cut them all open. And just so you know, you can also peel off the skin instead of cutting it with a knife and bite right into that juicy flesh. And some varieties are even fiberless, so I like peeling off the skin off of those fiberless ones and taking a nice juicy bite because the ones that have fibers get stuck in your teeth. <laughs> Anywho. I did end up breaking one out of four seeds, but the other three mangoes were looking golden and fresh. I figured I'd place the one that isn't broken back in the water to germinate where the other one failed. And the rest we would germinate on a damp piece of saran wrap and a little family all together. You can use paper towel to germinate your seeds, but I like saran wrap because it helps prevent mold a little bit more than the paper towel. Well, some time passed and our seeds began to germinate. I actually forgot to film a lot of this process, but a couple months passed and I went to check on the seeds and they mostly looked like this. I guess I waited too long with the seeds germinating in the saran wrap, so I got some soil and planted one right inside, kept one in the water germinating and the other two in the baggie to stay germinating on saran wrap. And a few months later, the seeds ended up turning black. But they still did have some oddly good growth. I was very unsure what to do at this point because we went through nine mangoes with about three of them succeeding and still growing in their little home. But it's all trial and <coughs> right? <coughs> well, as I was moving along in this journey, I learned that there are baby mangoes. I've never seen a mango that's smaller than the palm of my hand, but it's so cute. I feel like they just picked the mangoes off the tree way too early and then brought them to the market to sell them, but I cut it open and it was pretty easy. The seed came right out. The baby mangoes don't have a husk like the bigger mangoes, so they're way easier to crack open. But we tried to grow it and naturally, it started to look a little bit black and moldy. This was starting to be too common of an occurrence. However, it was starting to grow a baby tail too, so I have faith in this mango. And while we were waiting, along the way, I learned the coolest thing. There's a fruit that exists that tastes like a cotton candy cloud and they taste a bit like mango. Mango Steen, the queen of fruits. I actually spent one full year looking for this fruit and finally found them in Canada. But there is a reason why they're referred to as the queen of fruits. It has a unique sweet and sour taste like a mango and a beautiful deep purple rind. To cut these, you're supposed to make a circular cut along the equator and break the fruit in half and then remove the pulp. And if you count the bottom petals on the star shape, you'll know how many pieces of fruit will be inside. To grow one at home, you'll need a temperature of at least 10 degrees Celsius, but this honestly easily became my new favorite fruit. It grows exclusively in Southeast Asia and it's also widely cultivated in many countries like Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, India. But I got the seeds out. Each fruit usually only comes with one seed. I tried to peel that excess layer of skin off of the seed to prevent it from molding and then I also germinated some on a damp piece of paper towel to give us options for growth. I even put some seeds in the freezer just in case these seeds didn't grow successfully. I thought maybe having the seed go through stratification, which is just a process of cold, could help it grow better. Well, a few weeks passed and I went to check on the germinating seeds since no sprout was poking out of the soil yet. This is what they looked like. I really wasn't sure why they were turning black and not growing at all, but I had the right conditions for these to grow. So I placed them on a new fresh, clean piece of paper towel, waited a few more weeks and went to check on them again. And this is what they looked like. So I figured, let's get the ones out of the freezer. Let's get these seeds on a new piece of paper towel and wait for growth. So we're still waiting on those. But guys, while I was growing them, I saw these at Costco, freeze dried mango steam. I just had to try them. They were pretty good, not as good as the fresh fruit, but they would be pretty good in chia pudding or overnight oats for breakfast. But along the way, as we waited for our mango plant to grow up, I learned something that you've probably never heard about in your entire life. And I do need to tell you, I found these and I was so excited because you can never find them. They're called papa and they taste just like a mango. They're so hard to find because they only last three to five days after they're picked. And I never thought I'd get my pawpaws on one of these because they've got such a short shelf life. I've really only ever seen these once before in a high-end restaurant. It really tastes like a mango and has the same texture too. Maybe even a hint of banana in there. It's a very delicious fruit though. People usually eat this thing by ripping it open in the wild ripping forest, slurping the, the pulp forest. and spitting out the seeds. Think tapioca spitballs. But of course, we tried to grow them. We got the seeds on a damp piece of paper towel germinated them. Nah, I mean germinated. I sealed it in a bag and waited for them to grow. They're still chilling in the bag. I'm checking them religiously to see if they're growing. But guys, nine mangoes, five successful plants that are still growing, and a whole journey of mango. The different varieties, different ways of growing them. Plus all of my mistakes so that you don't make the same ones. And how to actually grow them successfully the first time around. One day soon, we're gonna have a farm with exotic fruit trees, chickens, ducks, 
So till next week, where we take seeds from exotic fruits and grow them into full-blown houseplants that fruit. Thank you so, so much for coming along this wild ride. You can now unbuckle yourselves. Without you guys, none of this would be possible. So don't forget to follow. Don't forget to subscribe. And I'll see you next week. Love you.